For present or future generations who are watching and listening to this recording of Captain Mitchell, my name is James Brooks Mitchell. I am the oldest son of Captain Lloyd Brooks Mitchell. This recording was made by my niece, his granddaughter, Amanda Mitchell, about 20 years ago. Today is July the 5th, 2022. That inspired me to put it together and write this book, Kipling's Heir of the Third, which hopefully you can still find. It's a story of a man in the Depression, his military career, and leading a great life. The CDs are on this little package right here, if they're still around. If they're not, it's on this recording uh, that I made using these CDs. Also, if you're interested in learning more, you can go to the YouTube site, Bubba, B-U-B-B-A, J-B-M. There are several interviews about Captain Mitchell on that site. Enjoy. God bless America. Well, where should I start? About yesterday. Um, told me we were of uh, Scotch-Irish descent. And uh, I don't know when the Mitchells came into uh, East Tennessee, but that's as far back as I can go on the Mitchell side. My uh, grandfather was John Franklin. My dad was James Walter. And uh, my grandfather's buried in the Cummingsville Cemetery, along with a lot of other Mitchells. And that would be in Van Buren County, Tennessee. My mother was from White County. My uh, dad uh, grew up on a farm in Van Buren. And then uh, he and Mom both taught school for I don't know how long, two or three or more years. I've got a picture of Dad in his class. I wish I could find it. I'd, I'd show it to you. But uh, then in the middle 20s, about 1925, they uh, moved to Akron, Ohio. Things weren't going well on the farm for them, and there were jobs in the north. So they moved to Akron, Ohio, and Dad worked in the rubber miller, the, the uh, Miller Rubber Company there for a period of about four years. And the work was too hard for him. Dad was a small man, and in that type of work, you had to do a lot of lifting. Let's stop now and see. So, uh, in 1927, he picked up and moved his family to uh, southwest Oklahoma, to Harmon County. The, uh, really, the earliest memories I have is... Uh, and I have a few memories in Akron, Ohio. Now, I think I'll switch gears here and tell a little, I've told you a little bit about the Mitchell family. Uh, my mother's name was Gamble. Her name was Lina Zella Gamble. And she was uh, one of 16 children. Two of them died at an early age, and the other 14 was raised to be grown. And, of course, my grandfather, William Solomon Gamble, was a farmer there in White County, close to Sparta. Uh, I don't know much about my great-granddad on that side, except that his name was Andrew Jackson Gamble. Uh, my uh, grandmother's name was Mary Paul. And I'm sorry, I just don't know one thing about, uh, about the Pauls. I wished I did. Now, uh, on the uh, Mitchell side, my great-grandmother was a Davis. And she was the uh, second wife of my uh, grandfather, John Franklin. John Franklin's first wife was a Cummins and then married uh, Nettie Davis. And uh, the story that was told to me was that uh, after my, uh, after, wasn't really my grandmother, but after my grandfather's first wife died, 
not too long after they had four children, and he rode up on his horse one day to the Davis house and asked for Nettie. Her name was really Janetta, and said, Nettie, I've got four kids and I can't raise them by myself. Will you come help me raise them? So Nettie agreed. And then they had uh, four children. Uh, they're, they're, they had uh, James Walter, my father, and Herbert, and Ephraim, and Bessie. Now that's the four that I remember. So that's... Uh, Kind of, kind of the my memories of what I not really my memories, but what I know about my ancestry. What about Absalom? Okay, uh, you ask about Absalom. Absalom was uh, an uncle. Absalom Davis was uh, uh, an uncle of my dad's, and uh, Absalom was a little touched. I think he lived uh, kind of a hermit in a cave. They called it Ab's Cave, and they still call it Ab's Cave, last time I was in Tennessee. Well, some of Ab's friends and relatives decided it just wasn't right that Ab lived in that cave. So they forcibly removed him, and he did not like the civilized life. And it wasn't long till Ab decided to go back to his cave, and as far as I know, he lived his life out in that cave. Uh, there is a genealogy of the Davis family that's quite interesting. Uh, it has some real interesting pictures in it. And it traces the uh, Davis family back to uh, James Davis, who was a veteran of the Revolutionary War. And James Davis came out of Virginia, to Tennessee. I'm not sure when he made the move. But it is a very good uh, genealogy. Uh, Boyd Austin, a distant cousin of mine, wrote the genealogy. There's uh, also a book that I have, A History of Van Buren County. And it's got some history about the uh, Mitchells in it. And if you're interested in the Mitchell roots, why... Uh, that would be a good book I could read, I could recommend. Uh, to my knowledge, no one has researched uh, the Mitchell line, that is, our, our line of Mitchells. And if one ever gets interested in genealogy, it would be a good line to research. Well, uh, continuing on uh, after we moved in 1927 to Harmon County, one reason Dad selected Harmon County, uh, one of his half-sisters, Aunt Sally, and her husband lived there. And uh, they wrote, I suppose, wrote and told Dad what a great country it was to live in. If they did, they really did deceive somebody. It wasn't all that swift. The rainfall was pitiful. And we landed there just before the Depression. So it didn't prove out to be too good for our family. Uh, I have kind of a faint memory of the move we made from Ohio. We uh, had a baby Overland. And that we made, we averaged 100 miles a day with that thing. It took us, it was about 1,400 miles from Akron to Harmon County, and it took us 14 days. Had lots of flats. Those days, you didn't have spare tires. You had to pull that old thing off and put a coal patch on it, and keep it jacked up, and hope it didn't go out on you too soon. We had lots of flat tires. And uh, another memory I have of that was uh, my kid brother Don, he was about three years old, and uh, we was having car trouble, and two of us, I don't remember whether I was one of the two or not, went across the road and found something interesting, and hollered, come over and see this, and Don dashed across the road, 
and the car hit him smack on. And we thought he's dead. We thought we'd lost him. Took him to the hospital and it turned out okay. He he was stunned, but he wasn't bad off. Uh, then when we moved to Harmon County, we uh, started uh, renting farms. Dad didn't have enough money to buy a farm, and uh, so we started uh, renting farms. And uh, that wasn't too good because. Uh, when the land was good, people would farm it. They wouldn't uh, wouldn't rent it out. And generally, the rented land was the poorest type land. So we didn't farm too many good good tracks. Uh, recalling some of the uh, kind of a life on the farm for a kid, I was nine years old. But kids started working early in those days. I started doing man's work at nine. We'd get up early and we'd milk the cows, slop the hogs, feed the horses, and then have breakfast. Then you'd harness the horses and take them out to the field. Or you'd grab a hoe. And we did lots of hoeing. Uh, they didn't have all the modern means of farming they have now where they spray for weeds and all that, you took a gooseneck hoe and got out there and chopped the weeds out of the cotton. Or you, uh, if it was your turn, and we we really kept close tab on whose turn it was, we'd get to ride a go-devil and uh, hitch a team up to a go-devil. Now, a go-devil is kind of a slide-type sled got two, two blades that stick out at an angle from the sled. And when you planted your cotton, you would uh, plant it, you, you would plant it on a ridge or plant it in a furrow. And you'd have, your cotton roll would be in a furrow and then you'd have two, uh, two ridges on either side. And so your sled ran right down that furrow and your two blades would cut through the cut through and cut the weeds off of the ridge. And then at the back of the sled you had some disc that you'd regulate and the disc would throw dirt into the cotton, not cover the cotton up, but throw dirt into the cotton and uh, kind of get rid of some of the weeds in that. And that we always like to do that rather than hoe, because you got to ride the sled. Horse yeah, team of horses pulled the sled. And then we had a cultivator, what we called a cultivator. You, when the cotton got up a little bigger, why you had uh, one had a, a one row cultivator. If you were fortunate, you'd cover two rows, but generally ours was just a one row cultivator, and it would had had. Uh, had some kind of blades on it that you'd go down the ridges and, and cut the weeds out. And uh, so we did that from generally you'd plant your cotton in May and then two or three weeks later you'd start working it. And we'd have to get out there and hoe. Weather was hot. Oh, it was hot. Sometimes you'd get up 105, 106 degrees. And this was sand. We, we farmed in sand country. And that sand got, man, it must have been 115, 120 degrees. And uh, we'd reach out with our hole and dig a hole and then dig a hole three or four inches deep for a little cooler. And then we'd jump to that hole and stand there and hole a while and dig another hole. And uh, we'd look up in the sky for clouds. Boy, if we saw a thunderhead, we'd really hope it'd come our way so it'd give us a little bit of shade. And that went on for several months, uh, two or three months. And uh, then, as soon as you, you, you call it laying by, as soon as you got your crops laid by, you'd, uh, you could go to school. We had, then we'd have school in August, 
you lie in August. And you think that wasn't hot. This little little school we, we went to was the OM school. And uh, you'd have uh, you'd have the windows open, but man, man, that that, that schoolroom was hot. And we would have uh, sometimes three and four grades together, and the teacher would teach three or four grades. Of course, there wouldn't be all that many kids, but uh, that was kind of. Uh, kind of life on the farm for a kid, and we'd move from rented farm to rented farm. We wouldn't wouldn't stay maybe two or three years on one and move to another. And I went to OM there, started in the third grade. I was in the third grade when we moved there. And one year we moved out on the plains of Texas. I was in the fifth grade then. And got to study Texas history. Tina, <laughs> and I found Texas history very interesting. Uh, but then we came back to the OM community, and I finished grade school in OM, and then went to Arnett, which was five or six miles from there, and uh, finished high school. Now, a big part of the time, mainly while we were going to OM, we had to walk. Uh, had to walk two and a half miles to school. And uh, that wasn't too bad, except in uh, July and August and in January and February when it was so cold. And I can still remember some of those cold northers coming down and walking home in them. But uh, we didn't think we were being unduly punished. That's just the way of life. Then about the time I started high school, I bus, we'd have to walk a mile to the bus line and the bus would pick us up. That was a lot better. Uh, Amanda asked me about the Dust Bowl. Yeah, we were right in the middle of the uh, big Dust Bowl. Now the main part of the Dust Bowl, I understand, started up in the Oklahoma and Texas Panhandle. And that was where the uh, dust got all picked up and, and carried then on to the south and east. But uh, those big dust storms would come in. You could see them rolling in. And oftentimes we didn't know whether they were storm clouds or whether they were just uh, a dust cloud. And we would, uh, we would stand at the edge of the cellar or a freight hole, just kind of a hole dug out in the ground with a wood, wooden door that we used for a tornado shelter and to see whether it was uh, dust or storm. And that, that was terrible. Uh, you couldn't, uh, when those things hit, your visibility was limited. You couldn't see hardly. And it just got everything, just covered everything in dust. And the house and everywhere else was just covered in dust. People would take uh, handkerchiefs and uh, wet them and tie it over their mouth and nose to breathe through, and uh, that 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 was uh, bad news. Uh, most of the time were drought years. We were there. Of course, the rainfall in Harmon County is low anyhow. I think something like 20 inches annual, and uh, oftentimes we didn't get the average. The years were the years were bad. Uh, cotton was a cash crop, and uh, the depression hit in 1929. Uh, the Wall Street uh, failed in 29, and prices dropped out of cotton. Cotton dropped down to uh, five cents a, a pound of lint, uh, and that that was awfully low. When we gathered cotton in the fall, we would pull bowls, we called it. We didn't pick cotton too much in Harmon County. It was mostly bowl pulling. And we'd have to get uh, 2,000 pounds of bowls to make a 500 pound of lint. And 
dad would get uh, $25 uh, for the bale. He would, uh, when they gin it, they'd keep the seed. The gin would keep the seed for the cost of uh, ginning. And so he'd make $25. Of course, he didn't get to, uh, he didn't get to keep all of that because every spring, I remember I'd go to the bank with him in the spring, and he wouldn't have enough money to buy the seed with, and and oftentimes he wouldn't have any grocery money. And he'd go into the bank and look at one of those cold-eyed bankers and plead for enough money to buy seed and buy a little groceries with. And then come fall, with, he'd pay it back and with interest, and he didn't have anything left. And I still, I hate to admit it, but I still kind of have an aversion to banks because that's one of my earliest memories, looking at those old cold-eyed bankers and pleading for money. Um, he didn't have, uh, of course, we lived on the farm, and the farms were, oh, maybe a quarter to half a mile apart. And uh, we didn't have, kids didn't have many things to do. Or shows, no, that was impossible nine miles to Hollis and all the way we'd have to go in the wagon or walk and sometimes we got bigger we'd hitchhike but uh, so you couldn't if you got to go to a show that was a big big happening for shows only cost 10 cents then uh, getting a haircut was I remember that boy I got up 15 or 16, I was kind of ashamed of my mother's haircuts, but I didn't have a, it took a quarter to get a haircut, a quarter was a lot of money in those days to find. But every once in a while I'd manage to save a quarter and get a haircut, and that was a big deal. Uh, we generally had to work six days a week. Uh, once in a while Dad let us off Saturday afternoon, but that was, that too was a big happening to get off on Saturday afternoon. Uh, when we could, we would, uh, one of our favorite pastimes was uh, chasing rabbits. We would have, uh, each of each family would have a greyhound or two, and, and we'd brag, the boys would brag on who had the fastest greyhound. We'd go out hunting rabbits. Uh, Oh, we see, well, I'm just, I'm talking about the period from 9 till uh, about 18. Uh, once in a while after we got, after we got bigger, uh, we would, uh, somebody would have a party, like, you know, teenage, 16, 17, started kind of shy, looking, looking crossways at a girl, you know, and, We'd go to a snap party. They'd call it snap. I can't remember too much about the game of snap, except a boy and a girl would be off over here holding hands, and another couple would come, and they'd chase each other around and tag each other, and then the one that got tagged would have to go out and find another partner or something like that. It was a very complicated game. <laughs> and uh, oh, they might have a, at one of those parties. They might have a little band, uh, somebody with a fiddle and a guitar and a banjo. Uh, might play some popular songs. And uh, of course, I thought the band was pretty neat, but I'm sure today's standards it wouldn't rate very high. <laughs> uh, Thinking about school days, uh, they would uh, pick up in the summer after the crops were laid by, and then uh, they would turn out come about October, as I remember, cotton would get ready to pull, and so then they'd dismiss for cotton pulling for about a month, and then they'd take, take back up. 
in school. And uh, like I say, the uh, kind of kind of primitive. Uh, I always loved school, though. I I just always did like school. Uh, I was good in uh, particularly good in spelling. I love spelling. Each year we'd have county contest, and there was a whole lot of small rural schools in Harmon County. And we'd have county contests, and I would represent my grade uh, from OEM in spelling. And I won first place, county first place, several times. I, I like to spell. I like arithmetic, but there was a kid in there that was a little better at arithmetic than me, and his name was Lloyd Mills. See, my name, I wasn't called Lloyd then, I was Brooks. Well, Lloyd and I would always contest each other to see who got to go to the county. And once or twice I beat Lloyd, and that was a real, that was a real happening when I could beat Lloyd out and get to represent OM in the, in the arithmetic match. Lloyd was a good friend. He and I went through all grade school and all high school together. He was a, he was a good buddy. Uh, then I went to, when I graduated from OM, went to Arnett, which is a rural high school in Harmon County, a few miles northwest of Hollis. And I went all four years to Arnett. And uh, again, uh, I liked school real well. One reason I think I did was uh, I couldn't, I, I wasn't a very good athlete. I, uh, I like to play baseball, and I generally made the baseball team, but I wasn't good at it. And uh, I lived too far away to play basketball. They'd practice after school hours. I lived so far away, I, I, if I'd stayed, I'd had to walk home, which would have been several miles. So I didn't, didn't try basketball. But to compensate for my lack of athletic ability, I, I like to beat everybody in grades. And uh, so we'd have tests, and I'd, I'd generally hold my own on the uh, test. And uh, I got to be the salutatorian, number two spot. I don't, I should have made number one, so I didn't. And uh, that was fun, you know. There was only 11 of us in our graduating class. <laughs> uh, Amanda asked me about an incident I had told her before. It was when we lived in Ohio, and I must have been about seven or eight years old. And uh, I don't know, I had enough money, I went and bought a sack of marbles. They were such shiny, pretty marbles, and I was so proud of them. And I started home with my marbles. Well, there was a couple of neighborhood kids there saw my marbles, and they conned me into playing, playing marbles with them for keeps. Now, that was a dumb thing to do, but I didn't, I didn't know it. And sure enough, they won all my marbles. And I went home just bawling my eyes out. I was so unhappy. And uh, John, my older brother, he asked me what happened, and I told him. He said, come on, go with me. Show me those kids. So I went back with John and showed him the kids. And John talked them in playing marbles, and he took, got my marbles back plus all of their marbles. But John was a good shooter. Uh, Amanda asked me about uh, making how we made any extra money. Well, uh, in the spring when we were working Dad's crops, Dad couldn't afford to pay us anything for chopping and cultivating and plowing, so we would work real hard to get his crops laid by so we could go out and find a neighbor that needed some help.
remember uh, hiring out to one of the neighbor farmers there, and he had a lot of Johnson grass in his cotton. Now, believe you me, Johnson grass is a real tough grass to get rid of. And so he, he gave us 10 cents an hour, and he wouldn't let you uh, work by yourself. He insisted he, he did work with you because what he was afraid of was that you'd be take too much time at the end of the row sharpening your hoe. We kept a rat tail file, and we'd kind of sharpen our hoe at the end of the row. And he, he might give you three or four minutes to sharpen your hoe, and then he wants you going right back down that row. And so you'd work 10 hours, and you'd make a dollar. And that was hard work. But we weren't. We didn't care. The idea of making a dollar was was wonderful. Uh, in the fall, we would uh, hustle around and get Dad's cotton out so we could throw a sack on our shoulder and go out and pull bowls for one of the neighbors and uh, make a little money that way. I remember one day that. Uh, I was determined I was going to pull 600 pounds of bowls. I was 12 years old. And we uh, found a neighbor that needed some, some help. And it was after frost. And the leaves were off the cotton. And it was what we call bumblebee cotton. It only grew to about uh, 12, 14 inches high. But it had lots of, lots of bowls on each stalk. So we would uh, go through and we'd strip it. Instead of picking a bowl off at a time, you'd just lock your hands under the plant and come up the plant and strip it, throw it into your sack, and grab the next plant. And I worked from sun to sun, and I got 603 pounds, and I was so proud of myself. And I got three dollars that day for pulling 600 pounds. They were paying us 33 cents a hundred. But uh, tickle, oh man, I felt rich when I went home that night. A man asked me about, did your fingers get hurt? Yeah, I'm pulling bowls. They got hurt. We had had just canvas gloves and. Uh, they would kind of wear out at the fingertips, and then those uh, harsh burrs at the end of the cotton bowl would kind of scratch and cut your fingers. And then another bad part of the thing was your back would get so tired stooping over that you'd have to get down on your knees. And uh, we had, uh, if, you were, if you were wealthy enough, you had uh, leather knee pads. Now that was a real luxury. Most of the time we just had knee pads that our mother made out of quilted material and straps and the old goat heads would stick through those and get in your knees and the sand burrs were, they were mean too so quite often you'd have sand burrs and goat heads stuck in your knees. Amanda was asking me about uh, experiences at school. Uh, mostly school for me was uh, a good experience. I love to read. I remember in uh, Ohio, in the first two grades, we uh, studied phonics. And I would go around reading, reading words on groceries and everything else. And uh, so I love to read, and um, as I said before, I loved uh, spelling and arithmetic and history. And uh, so mostly school was a good experience. There was uh, some experiences I remember that weren't too good. Uh, going to high school, uh, it was kind of a tradition that all the boys would play hooky on April Fool Day. 
And so we'd get on the bus, and we'd have it made up where we were going to get off the bus. And we'd get off the bus someplace between home and school, and we'd play games all day and have fun. And then we knew when we got back, we were going to get a whipping. And the principal would call us in. This was even in high school. The principal would call us in, and he'd give us a pretty sound whipping. I remember one time, uh, what caused me to do this, I'll never know. It was a stupid thing to do. At a basketball game, after the game was over, I lit a firecracker inside the gym. Man, I caught down the line for that one. <laughs> but, uh, but mostly high school was, uh, was a good experience. Uh, as for... Uh, Housing, uh, it was it was tragic, the housing we lived in. Uh, as I said before, uh, people that had uh, tenant farms, they wouldn't spend a dime on the old cotton shacks on the farm. And they were just, uh, just that, cotton shacks, uh, no, absolutely no insulation, uh, no electricity, no running water, Flies, the flies in the summertime was awful, just terrible. Uh, most of the time, the water situation wasn't good. We lived for several years. We lived up on the Salt Fork River, and I remember we had a well, just a dug well, and that thing would tend to go dry in the summertime. And I remember. Uh, Dad would uh, lower us down. It was a deep well, probably, maybe it seemed like 35, 40 foot deep. And uh, we'd have a pulley, and one of us kids would get on the bucket and ride that bucket down to the bottom of the well and dig the sand. It was all sand. And we'd, uh, we'd try to deepen the well, and we'd dig the sand out and put it in the bucket, and they'd pull it up. And it's a wonder we hadn't been killed because that blame, blame well was nothing but sand and it could have caved in. But none of us were killed, luckily. Uh, then our neighbor had a spring and when that well went dry, well, we'd uh, hitch the teams up to a wagon and put barrels in the wagon and we'd go to his spring and we'd load up the load up the water and take it back. That's quite a chore getting drinking water and you'd have to get stock water also because they had to have water. Then when we lived out south of Hollis, uh, we lived in what was known as Jip country. And that, it was a, a gypsum area. And that water, well, you couldn't, couldn't bear to drink it. It was not fit for human consumption. Even the stop would have a hard time in the hot summer weather of drinking it. And uh, then we uh, we'd have a, had a cistern at our place, and uh, we'd catch roof water off the roof to fill the cistern up. And when it didn't rain, then we'd have to have water brought out from town in a tank truck. And that cistern uh, had kind of a cover on it, but it didn't serve too good. And oftentimes you'd have birds roosting on it and bird waste to get in the water. And it's a wonder we hadn't died from typhoid. Uh, about uh, how, how, what kind of food, we uh, didn't have a great variety of food. Uh, we raised uh, gardens. But in that dry country, uh, raising food wasn't too easy. Uh, your droughts would hit and your gardens would dry up. But we'd managed to raise uh, peas and beans. And uh, sometimes we had, uh, had corn, if you could get it raised before the drought hit. And uh, as far as meat, in the fall of the year, we would we'd raise hogs, and we would uh, butcher the hogs in the fall. And 
always look forward to that. And then we had a smokehouse. We'd uh, butcher the hogs and we'd ha hang up the hams and the shoulders in the smokehouse. And mother would go out and cut off, slice off some meat then. But uh, come, come spring, why, that meat would get rancid and go sour on you. And so you couldn't eat it. Uh, we very seldom had beef because uh, we had a few cows, but all the calves dad would keep to sell for a little bit of cash money and uh, you couldn't couldn't afford to have uh, beef but uh, come spring we'd have fried chicken oh, a lot of fried chicken so uh, in the spring you'd have uh, have chicken and a lot of biscuits and Mother always made tea cakes, she called them. They were a little sugar cookie. And she always made a lot of chocolate pies. And, but uh, taking food to school was kind of a sad deal. We uh, didn't have lunch buckets. We had an old uh, lard can, a gallon-sized lard can. And you'd drive nail holes in the lid, and uh, you'd carry biscuits and bacon and that would get sweaty and soggy and come come noon it wouldn't be too uh, too good uh, I remember once in a rare occasion we'd have uh, we called it light bread and boy if you had uh, if you had a light bread and lettuce sandwich I I drool all the way to noon thinking about that that was a rare occasion. It's just white, what you call white bread. Sometimes we call it bottom bread. <laughs> Thing about the government programs in those days, and there there was a lot of them when uh, President Roosevelt came into power in 1932, and that was the hard part of the depression and so there was a, a number of government programs started to alleviate the uh, not only the farmers but all of the people of the country uh, yes it, that was called the New Deal uh, those programs that I remember the WPA and that for some reason or other dad, dad couldn't couldn't or didn't get into that too much because I don't remember really any income coming from the WPA. That was the Works Progress Administration. The uh, program that directly impacted our family was the CCCs, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And uh, my older brother John graduated from high school in 1934. And then he went to a CCC camp at, uh, out of Lawton in the uh, Wichita Mountains. And there uh, they uh, built dams, they uh, built bathhouses, they built trails, uh, they built picnic tables, picnic areas, and things like that. A lot of the work that the CCCs did is still evident. For instance, then John, from the C John spent about three years in the CCCs, and then he came to Oklahoma City and went to Hills Business College. Uh, then I went into the CCCs directly out of high school. I graduated in uh, 37, and then sometime in the fall of 37, I went to the uh, CCC camp at Lugert. Uh, Lugert is... Uh, 20, 30 miles north of Altus, and it's the location of the present Quartz Mountain State Park. And there we did kind of the same type of work, uh, bathhouses, picnic areas, picnic grounds, uh, trails, uh, dams, and things like that. Uh, we made a uh, dollar a day and we had to send $25 a month home to our folks, and we got to keep $5 a month. And that really did, uh, 
help dad and mom to get $25 a month coming in. That was, that was really a big, big help to them. Uh, at the CCC's, why I started out, I was kind of what we called a pick and shovel man. That's one of your lowest categories. And then uh, I gradu graduated into uh, an assistant camp engineer. That's a high sounding title, but all it meant was I drug the rod and the chain for the camp engineer. Uh, I have a very good memory about that. Uh, one day, it, the weather was bad, and we were sitting in the engineering building, and his name was English. He was an awful nice man. And he said to me, uh, Mitchell, did you ever think about going to college? And I said, Mr. English, there's nothing in the world I'd rather do. But I don't have any money. My folks don't have any money. And I don't know how on earth I could go to college. And his reply, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I've got a good friend at Lawton at Cameron Junior College. His name is Clarence Breedlove. I'll write Clarence and see if he can possibly find a job for you. What do you think about that? And I said, I'll do it. I don't know whether I can make it or not, but I'll sure try it. So, got a letter back from Dean Breedlove. He offered me a $9 a month job. Now, that was half room and board room and board cost $18 a month. And in, in January of 1939, I went to Cameron. I remember that morning, a northern blowed up. It was cold. And I didn't, I had $25. Uh, Dad and Mom had managed over a year and a half to save $25. Had $25 in my pocket. I had to walk down to Hollis, which is about two miles, on Highway 62. Stick my thumb in the air and hitchhike a ride to Lawton, which is about 100 miles east of there. So I started at the Cameron in January of 1939. Made it. I don't know how, but I made it. When I was just at rock bottom, I mean rock bottom, John, somehow or other, would find five or ten dollars for me. He was working up here at the city and doing everything under the sun to make a buck while he went to Hills Business College. But he could always find when it just come right down to rock level, a little bit of money for me. Amanda asked me, how did I make that other nine dollars? Well, that was that was the tough part, doing that. Uh, I would go to Lawton, and that time, Lawton was a couple of miles from Cameron, and I remember hitting the bowling alleys, and I'd set pins, as I remember, I got a nickel a line, and you had to set pins then. You didn't have the automatic setters. And I remember having to be very careful because those pins coming through could really break your leg if it hits you. You'd set them, and then you'd run and hide somewhere till, till they bowled. And then I got a job at the Fairmont Creamery, and that was uh, kind of heavy work sometimes. The cream cans full of cream, I don't know, they'd weigh 75, 80 pounds. And you'd have to sling them up on a truck to load the truck out to wherever they took the cream. And uh, I remember one Christmas, uh, I picked turkey feathers. They had, uh, they killed turkeys there. And uh, what they'd do, they'd kill the turkey and then they'd put it on a, chain, and the chain would go round and round, and the 
and you'd have people lined up picking feathers. Well, I got a job of picking tail feathers. Now, if you've ever tried to pull a tail feather out of a turkey, you know it's a tough job. Well, I did that, and I think I got 15 cents an hour for that. But I did that for a few days, and then come to find out I, I, I couldn't put a tie on. I couldn't I, I couldn't button my shirt because my my thumb and my index finger was so sore that I just I, I couldn't button my shirt. And eventually I lost the nails on my thumb and index finger because I had bruised them picking those blame turkey feathers. <laughs> about the CCC camps, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to get to be the assistant camp engineer, and uh, the good part, I liked the work, the uh, camp engineer was a real nice guy to work for, and I drug a chain and held a rod for him, but the best part was I had a, had a, uh, a building of my own to live in. Uh, I slept, uh, slept in the uh, camp engineering building and kind of watched over watched over the equipment but uh, I hated those barracks we had uh, when I went there we lived in the barracks and there must have been 40 50 guys to a barracks and there was absolutely no privacy and the noise was terrible and the guys were not all the best type of guys so that really did please me to uh, to get to uh, sleep in the engineering building. And I took, uh, I took, it, but they had an educational program. They would have education classes at night, and I took several of those. And one thing I remember that really did help me out, another guy and I went together and we bought an old uh, standard typewriter. And uh, we bought an instructional book and we taught ourselves how to type. And uh, so that has come in in my life, has really came in really handy all the rest of my life. Uh, in addition to that, at Cameron, I took a typewriting class and further learned to type. So I've used that typing uh, skill uh, the rest of my life. Uh, I ran the, uh, in addition to uh, being assistant camp engineer, I uh, ran the water pump for a while. We were located on camp on Lake Luger, and uh, the uh, water pump was down on the uh, lake. And I'd go down and start to pump up and pump the uh, tank full of water. We had a water tank sitting up on top of a small mountain there, and I'd pump till I saw the water running out of the tank, and then I'd shut it off, and I'd have the rest of the day to read. So I really did a, got to do a lot of reading in those uh, those days. And the camp was, uh, by and large, the camp was a good experience. You met some kind of rough characters there, but you had to learn how to deal with that. And uh, I got to go home. It wasn't too far. It was about 60 miles from home. I'd get to go home once in a while, I'd have to hitchhike home. Uh, some of the experiences at Cameron Junior College, as I stated, I started there in uh, January of '39, and I went. Uh, then I went that semester, and then I went uh, two more years, the fall of '39, and then on into '40, and graduated with the graduating class in '41. Uh, uh, those two and a half years were, looking back on it, were perhaps the uh, some of the best best time I ever had in my life. I love school. I remember the first was starting in mid semester, and I took some sophomore classes. And I was scared to death. Man, I had been out of high school all of two two and a half years, and I thought I was so rusty and so out of out of the habit, I wouldn't be able to make it. But sure enough, I made straight A's. A's and everything I took that semester, and 
After that, I slowed down. I said, ah, this is a bunch of baloney. And so I started having a good time. Well, I still made A's and B's, but I never did try again to make straight A's. I was taking agriculture then. I started out taking agriculture, majoring in that. Because, you know, at that damn time, I thought everybody in the whole world farmed. And I thought that was the only occupation there was. But after I'd gone there about a year, why, uh, this Dean Breedlove that I'd referred to before, he was teaching chemistry. He was a good chem teacher, and I changed my major to chemistry then. So I started taking all the chemistry I could and all the math I could. Chemistry came easy to me. I loved chemistry. Math came awfully hard. I don't know, maybe it's because I didn't have a background in math in high school. But I struggled in math. I remember particularly I was taking a course in calculus, and that just about kicked me had a little buddy, his name was Muscles. Now Muscles must have weighed about 125 pounds. He had asthma, but he was a fun-loving kid and he had a head on his shoulders. He was a whiz, that man. And Muscles pulled me through calculus. Uh, met, uh, met Mabel there at Cameron met Mabel in the uh, fall of 1939. And it wasn't too long after I met her in church. Met her in church, went to church there at 6th and Arlington. And uh, Mabel, she was a dedicated Christian. And so uh, we got along fine till I don't know, must have been late 40s or something. She got mad at me or something I said. I popped off and said something I shouldn't have said. I don't remember now what it was, but she got awful mad at me, and she dropped me like a hot rock. Well, I flubbed around for a while, and then uh, after I, uh, well, let's see, a little more of the experiences there in Cameron, uh, had an opportunity to learn to fly. They had the government established what they call a CPT, a Civilian Pilot Training Program. I'm sure the uh, people in charge of the government could see World War II coming on, and they wanted to train as many, get as many kids interested as they could in flying. So uh, I enrolled in that program, and uh, for $40, total of $40, you could get your private pilot's license and take all the ground school to get your license. So I did that and got my private pilot's license. Incidentally, uh, up to this time, I did not have a driver's license, so I got my pilot's license before I did my driver's license. Then. Uh, Graduated in the spring of 1941 from Cameron. I went two and a half years there. And I started casting around trying to find another school to go to. Well, I checked with Panhandle A&M up at Goodwill. I checked with OSU at Stillwater. I checked with OU at Norman. And uh, my dad knew a state representative. Mr. Crow from Harmon County. So Mr. Crow got me a job at Norman, and uh, the job was room and board and laundry, and I would be locked up with a hundred insane people from ten at night to two in the morning. That's quite a job. I'd try to study at night, but Kind of hard to study. Put those guys, get those guys to bed, and try to keep them, keep them in bed. And about a hundred of them. And it's, it's pretty difficult. I remember one incident. I remember, and it was kind of a mean incident. One guy there came up to me and said, "Hey, I'm going to kill you." And I said, "Hey, look, I'm your buddy. I'm your friend. 
I, I've never done anything to you. I don't intend to do anything to you. Trying to talk him out of it. Well, about midnight one night, I was sitting there trying to study. He slipped up behind me and grabbed me and tried to choke me. He was trying to choke me to death. Well, I was pretty strong then, and I managed to get a hold of him and take him to the floor. And I beat his head against the concrete floor until I knocked him unconscious. And uh, I thought, well, that's the end of my job. I'm going to be fired. Superintendent called me in a day or two. He had heard about it. He asked me what happened. I told him. I said, man, I didn't really want to hurt the guy, but he was trying to kill me, and I couldn't do anything else but. So he didn't fire me. Well, I went to OU there for one semester, and I was taking chemistry. And uh, come Christmas time, and school was let out for Christmas vacation, and then it was going to take back up again for two or three weeks. November of that year, I had come up to Oklahoma City to take my Air Corps examinations. I had tried to get the uh, draft chairman in Harmon County to give me an exemption. I'd written him and explained to him how I had three years in, and I was a chem major, and that would help the war effort and all of that sort of stuff. But he, I kind of blamed him then, but looking back, I can't blame him. He didn't give me an exemption. So I thought, well, I sure don't want infantry. So inasmuch as I had a private pilot's license and knew how to fly the little light planes, I came up and to the city and passed all my, thought I'd passed all my exams. I went to see the uh, dean there, and it was, a, you can't imagine what a difficult time it was there in the fall of 41. We could, this was before Pearl Harbor, but we could see World War II coming on. We could see there was nothing else but. So we were all in an uproar, shall we stay in school, shall we go into the military, what shall we do? This was the fall of 41, I was 23, I was 23. Well, I went to the dean and I said, look, I've passed my Air Corps exams, I would like to go home Christmas. And if at all possible, I would like to spend a little time with my parents before I have to go into the military. And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, you take, he handed me a form, you take this around to each of your instructors. And you get them to put down the grade that you have at Christmas time. And that will be your grade for the semester. I said, okay. I was taking a rough course. I was taking calculus. I was taking physics. I was taking German. I was taking uh, calculus, and physics, and German. I can't remember that. I was taking about four courses. Well, I had passing grades, so they, the instructors wrote it down. Then I, come February of uh, 42, I was called into the Air Force. And uh, I was called, they called me. I had passed all my exams up here. And they called me, said, you know, come, we've got a place for you. And went down to Houston, Texas, Ellington Field. Lo and behold, I got a notice from OU that I had four eyes incomplete. That rocked me. I thought, those dirty so-and-sos, they promised me I would pass with the grade I had at Christmas time, and they didn't follow through. That was my experience at OU. I still think that's probably what I don't care for OU. <laughs> Uh, uh, 
I never did get never did get credit. Well, on my Air Corps exams, I came up in November, I remember, uh, to Will Rogers Airfield, and uh, there was a whole bunch of guys taking the exams at that time. And I remember I did real good, and the doctor examining my eyes, this was about noontime, examining my eyes, said, uh, said to me, son, it's about noontime. Uh, you did so good on the rest of the exam, physical and all, and you're just not quite up to standard here on your eyes. It looks like one of your eyes is checking out 2030, and we're supposed to have 2020 in both. Said, uh, let's uh, let's break for lunch, and we'll come back, and I'll give you another chance at it. Okay. So as we walked out of that room at lunchtime. I glanced up and I saw the number of the room. I ate lunch hurriedly, snuck back into that room, memorized that 2020 line, and I can still tell you what it is R, date, or D, Z, and B. R, D, A, P, E, O, R, F, D, Z, and B. So I passed. Then uh, I was called back in, I believe it was February 42, and I remember I'd been up to see Mabel. By that time, her and I had got back together again, and we had decided we were going to make a twosome. We were going to make a go of it. I had written her and apologized for making her mad. She and Mabel, in the meantime, had gone to Stillwater. She'd gone to Stillwater in the fall of 41 and I'd gone to OU. So she decided, well, I guess he's okay. So <laughs> we were sweethearts again then. So I came back down here and they gave another eye test. That's, that caught me by surprise. I thought, what? I've already passed that blame thing. I remember we had a long line, a long snaky line, coming up to reading the eye chart. And they had a had a partition there, and I started listening, and I thought, oh, that's not my line. That's a different chart. My heart was sinking. And three or four people, before I got to read the eye chart, they changed charts again. Yeah! They put my chart on. <laughs> so I whipped through that dude. <laughs> uh, Amanda wants to know some more about uh, her grandma and I. We met, uh, I believe it was September 39. She had come down from Broken, from Broken Air on Bixby, where Grandma Mabel grew up. She came to Cameron, and uh, so we started uh, started dating. And uh, there wasn't too much; uh, didn't have any money. Oftentimes, uh, all I had maybe was a dime or fifteen cents, and we'd go go buy a coke and get two straws and share a coke together. And one of the incidents I remember my uh, roommate, Clark Hawes, he had a battery-powered radio, and that was something. And once in a while, I'd have a date with Mabel, and uh, she would, uh, we would listen to the hit parade, the Lucky, Lucky Strike hit parade, and we'd walk around campus and listen to the hit parade. That kind of be our, our outing, and share a coke beer. Sometimes I'd buy a package of dentine gum and we'd share that. Uh, I remember Mabel telling me how she picked me out. She didn't really pick me out. We, uh, uh, shortly after I started school there, went to church at uh, Sixth and Arlington Church of Christ. And, uh, so Mabel and a friend, her friend's name was Belle Verde. Belle Verde was tall, 
Bel Verde must have been about six foot tall, and Mabel was probably five four, five five, something like that. So me and another guy placed membership. You you know you'd go up front and tell them you wanted to be a member of that church. So we placed membership. And so Mabel and Val Verde, they sat back there watching the proceedings, and uh, Mabel said, uh, I'll get the tall one, and you get that other guy, which was me. <laughs> well, it turned out just opposite. Somehow or other, Mabel and I got acquainted and started going together. And then Val Verde and this, ta and, and this other fellow, they married also. So they both the girls found found husbands that night. Uh, she was a lot of fun. We'd we'd go off on church parties together, go up to the Wichita Mountains on hay rides and things like that. I remember telling her one night we was up there and we was kinda off to ourselves and I told her where a pretty lake was. We started up to that lake. It's quite a little bit farther. She got suspicious of me, and I remember she said, "There's no lake up here. Let's go home." She turned around. And we went back. She was afraid I was taking her to a non-existent point. I wasn't really. There was a lake up there. <laughs> and then one time, it must have been in the fall of 1940, uh, she got mad at me. I Something was said, and I said something I shouldn't. I don't even remember what it was. She got mad at me. And boy, I mean, she was mad. She wouldn't date me anymore. Wouldn't even speak to me. So I was pretty unhappy about that, because I thought a lot of Mabel. And she went, then she went up to Stillwater to school, and I went to OU. And must have been sometime in all of 41, I remember writing her, apologizing, tell her I was sorry she got mad and wanting to know if we could, couldn't date again. And so she agreed. And uh, I remember I went I went to see her then. Her and her sister Elizabeth were living in Tulsa. There's a bridge across the Arkansas there, close to downtown Tulsa. I don't remember what the name of the bridge is. I remember the night. It was a light rain, not a heavy rain, and we were walking across the bridge in the rain. And I asked her if she wanted to get married. She said, yeah, she thought that'd be all right. So sometime in the fall there of 41, why we, uh, we decided we became engaged. Then, uh, I went into the Air Force and went to Ellington for a little while and then went up to San Antonio, Kelly Field. And uh, May, Mabel and I were married in May of 1942 while I was in navigation school in Kelly Field. I remember she coming down and uh, came down by herself on the bus, had a tin suitcase came down to get married by ourselves and uh, we got married in the Church of Christ there and she had a couple of friends there, a man and a wife that she had known in Tulsa. They, uh, they came to the wedding and I had a best friend, he was uh, Clark Halls, he was my college roommate. Clark was at another air base there. Clark was my best man. And so uh, we got married. We wasn't supposed to. In those days, air cadet was not supposed to be married. You were single when you went in. And I remember one time uh, I was out at the air base and come over the loudspeaker, Lloyd Mitchell, uh, your wife wants you to call her. Somehow or other, I don't know, I hadn't called. I'd been off on the flight or something. Scared me to death. Your wife? I'm out of here. I thought they were going to kick me out, you know. 
<laughs> Nothing was said. <laughs> And uh, that was a that was a good time there. It was hard. It was hard work. Navigation school, learning how to navigate and how to, you know, how to tell the pilot where to go, what what heading to take, and all of that. And two or three times, I thought I was going to wash out, but uh, Mabel kept saying, "No, nah, you're going to make it." So that's what you say all the time. Bust out. Said you've never busted out of anything yet. You're not going to bust out of this. Well, sure enough, sure enough, I didn't bust out. Uh, I seemed to me like I could get down there. About she, she had a place to live there in San Antonio, and she, we didn't have. I was only making seventy-five dollars a month, and she worked at Joskies. I think there's still a Joskies in uh, San Antonio. She worked at Joskies to help us make enough money to live on. Maybe I got to see her once a week, something like that. I remember uh, trying to get a. It wasn't my wasn't my time to take a take leave or get out. I, was, I borrowed somebody else's. I, I've forgotten how they did it. Maybe it was on on past numbers or something. I borrowed one of my buddies' passes, and they had photo identification. Passes did. Going to the gate that night, so I kind of hung my head where the guard couldn't see me. I didn't think, and handed him this pass, my buddy's pass. It wasn't mine. He said, "Hey, look at." Me. That this is not you. You're Lloyd Mitchell. Yeah. How'd you know? Is the school buddy. No. We'd went to school together. He said, man, I had it made from then on. He said, here's here's the hours I'm at on the guard gate. You can come through and tell me you want to. <laughs> so I had it made. Okay, then... Uh, Graduated from navigation school in July, July the 4th, 1942. Mabel and I were married May the 2nd, 1942. And uh, that was a great day, getting a second lieutenant's commission. And uh, that meant a lot more money, make a lot more You know, I, I don't remember. It seems to me like we got 250, seemed to me like we got something like 250, 300 a month after we got our second lieutenant's commission. That was a good, a good salary. And uh, I went out to the bank and barred, there was a bank there, Sam Houston Bank in San Antonio. And they would loan money to fresh second lieutenants because they figured they were pretty good risk. Remember buying an officer's suit? Oh, it was pretty. I bought pink pink trousers and the blouse, kind of an olive drab, olive green blouse that went with it. Bought bars, second lieutenant bars, and I was so proud. And they were Hart Schaffner and Marks. They 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 were making uniforms and uh, so from there I went to uh, Florida a base in Florida a little while and uh, no she didn't go because I didn't know how long I was going to be there and uh, then um, I went to this was in 42 and then went to Boise Boise, Idaho, and uh, that was where the uh, 96 bomb group was formed. They brought in uh, pilots, navigators, bombardiers, gunners, radio men, engineers, brought them all into Boise, and they formed crews. They formed air crews. 
then you remain with your crew. You train, the rest of your training was done with your air crew, and then you went overseas and you fought combat with your air crew. I had, a, I really had a good crew. This would have been in the fall of 42. And Rube Nye was the pilot. He was from North Texas. He was from Cranville Gap, Texas. Ole Asper was the co-pilot. He was from Oregon. Manuel Mendelssohn was from uh, Philadelphia. He was a Jewish guy. And then myself, that made up the four officers of the combat crew, and then we had uh, six other guys, Nelson, Nelson was the engineer, and White was the assistant engineer, and uh, Lakey, Colt Lars, Malinowski were the gunners, Hazeltine was the uh, radio man, and I believe that makes up the ten. So then we trained uh, several places, uh, Walla Walla, Washington, Pocatello, Idaho, Rapid City, South Dakota, uh, Piote in Texas. You know where Piote is? It's the end of the world. <laughs> it, it didn't bother me too much. Some of the old boys from the east, not used to the wind and the sand and the dirt, you know, that's what you had in Pio. And that wind and dirt would sift and blow. And I just thought it was natural. That's what I was used to. Those guys from the East Coast, they complained bitterly. <laughs> Their fate and landing at Pio. <laughs> Amanda was asking about uh, Mabel and how she uh, would follow me from base to base. Uh, whenever it appeared, you could never know for sure, but whenever it appeared that I might be at a certain base, say for six weeks or two months, one, uh, Mabel would get the baby. Brooks was little then. He was born in August of 43. And she would get on the train and she would come up and Sometimes, if I was just going to be there a short while, she'd get a room in a motel. But if it appeared like I was going to be there for any length of time, I, we'd, we'd try to find a place to rent. Uh, one of the things I remember so well is that uh, members of the church were so good and treated us so nice. Uh, the guys were all jealous of me. We'd, uh, we'd uh, move and Mabel and I would be one of the first couples to find a place to live. And a lot of times it would be we'd go to church and we'd get acquainted and ask them if they knew of a place to live. And they'd either maybe own a rent property or knew somebody that owned a rent property. So we were kind of fortunate in uh, that regard. But that was kind of, kind of tough uh, on her uh, having to drag the baby around. I remember one incident, and this happened uh, after I'd come back from England. Uh, I'd been sent to Tucson, Arizona, and Mabel and I were traveling on the train going to Tulsa. I was headed for Pueblo up to the base, but we were going to Tulsa to spend a little while. And um, so we rode, we had to change trains, I remember. and. Uh, so we got off the train and got our suitcases and started out. Pretty soon here come an old boy just screaming, stop, stop. So we turned around and asked him what he wanted. But it turned out we had two suitcases that looked just alike. Well, Mabel had packed, she had packed uh, baby bottles and diapers and things like that in our suitcase for drugs. This other old boy had a lot of whiskey he had packed in his. And so we'd switch, we'd accidentally switch suitcases. And he got the baby bottle and the diapers, and we got the whiskey. So when he found it out, he was kind of alarmed about it. So we, we too, we'd much rather have the baby bottles than we had the whiskey. 
but uh, that was kind of funny. Uh, one incident I remember, to, looking back on it, it was a sad incident. We were in uh, Salina, Kansas, and that was the uh, last uh, air base in the U.S. before we went overseas. And we were training there, and hadn't been there too long, and wasn't expected to stay too long. But uh, they, uh, when, whenever we got our shipping orders, we couldn't, we weren't allowed to talk to the telephone or tell anybody we were shipping out or anything like that. And I remember Mabel had a room there and uh, had two or three false alarms. And she thought we were gone, and two or three days I'd show up. And then finally, sure enough, we. Uh, we left for overseas, and she told me later, she said, I stayed a whole week looking for you to come back, and you didn't come back, so I went home, and I thought about that, that's kind of sad, she standing around waiting on me to come back, and I didn't show up, but it was hard, the war was hard on the wives, it was hard on the wives, it was on the Uh, well, that was, a, of course, that was a grand, grand occasion uh, to see Uncle Brooks. That was after I'd, uh, I'll, I'll cover that a little bit later on. When, uh, so, uh, we went to uh, Presque Isle, Maine for our jumping off spot. We flying our B-17s. That night, we left from Salina, we were headed toward Presque Isle, and uh, ran into some real bad weather. We were supposed to go to one base that night, I've forgotten where the base was, but it socked in, and clouds and weather didn't. So while we were in air flying, they radioed us to go to another base, and said we couldn't get in to where we wanted to go. So. Uh, we had to go to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the alternate base. And I remember Rube calling down and telling me to give him a head for Harrisburg. So we had a little hard time finding it. The weather wasn't too good. Harrisburg was built right on the uh, banks of the Susquehanna River and uh, right in the uh, valley of the Susquehanna. Rube was sick. He had been in the hospital very recently. Uh, I've forgotten the reason why, but he had to go to the hospital for two or three days. He wasn't feeling good at all, so he let Ole, the co-pilot, do the landing. And we were coming into the uh, coming into the air base there at Harrisburg, and uh, there was a big uh, high uh, towers on the right. Uh, looked like generating towers, the big high generating towers, and Ole was uh, a little nervous about them, and he was watching, he was watching the towers to be sure he missed them, Well, he forgot to watch the uh, runway, and there was some high trees right on the uh, edge of the runway, and Ole come in and sawed off a bunch of trees with the uh, plane. And I remember being in the nose and hearing the, hearing those wings crack through the trees. And I thought, man, we're gone this time. And the old plane lurched and kind of kind of buckled. And then Rube, Rube grabbed the throttles and kicked it, kicked all four forward throttles. And the plane managed to pick up flying speed again. And we went around come back around and landed, but uh, there was logs stuck in the two right engines and the uh, right wing was torn, so we lost, uh, we lost the plane there, we, we had to pick up a new plane, they sent a new plane in for us, they had to get a new wing and two new engines for that one. Uh, then we went up to Presque Isle, Maine and spent a little while there, and then we 
then we had to ferry the uh, had to ferry the planes across the North Atlantic. Prescott, Maine, we went to uh, Gander Lake, Newfoundland. And from Gander Lake, we, uh, we were going to ferry the planes across the North Atlantic. And I remember I was in the hospital there at Gander Lake. I had a bad cold, and we were flying to altitude. And those old 17s weren't air weren't, uh, They didn't uh, have compression. They were just open. So flying altitude with a head cold is not recommended, and I spent two or three days or more there with ears, ear problems. Got over that. They, uh, I remember they uh, briefed us on uh, flying across the Atlantic. We were to uh, uh, hit. We were to we were to go to Ireland and strike a spot in Ireland, and then fly to Prestwick, Scotland. The weather was supposed to be good that night, and uh, not supposed to be any storms. So we took off, and first thing you know, it began to get stormy. We had to start climbing. And the further we went, the worse the storm got, and the higher we had to climb. We had to get up 20, 25,000 feet to get above the storm. And I started taking star fixes. Uh, that was all, all you had to navigate when you were in a situation like that, was navigate to the stars. And now star, celestial navigation, is not too rough if you've got a stable platform to shoot from. What you do, you had your sextant, and you knew you knew the navigational stars. There's a number of navigational stars. And you knew your star and you would you would take your sextant and fix it in the stars in the sextant sides and click it. What you were doing, you were measuring the altitude of the star above the Earth's horizon. That's what you were measuring. As long as you had a stable platform to shoot from, that was a pretty good method of navigation. Because you'd shoot one star, and you, and then you had your tables you would go to, and you'd plot it on your map, and you would get a LOP, a line of position, which meant that you were somewhere along this line. You didn't know where. You were somewhere along this then you would pick another star, preferably 90 degrees from your first star, or it didn't have to be 90, it might be 60, or, but it, had, it needed to be some distance from the first star. Then you would shoot it and get you another LOP. Then you would have to move your first LOP because of time lapse between your two lines of position. You'd take them at different times. And time was important. When you'd shoot that sextant, you'd look at your watch and get the time and write it down. Then you would take a third line of position and hopefully, if you did it right, and advanced your first two lines of position, then you would have a triangle. And that triangle was supposed to be pretty small, and you were supposed to be right in the middle of that triangle, your plane was. But the problem was, when you had an unstable platform like a OB-17 in a storm, you had a lot of difficulty getting, you would have to take eight or ten sightings on one star and then take an average. When you when you clicked your sextant it'd make a little mark but you had to then you'd take an average. Well I got started working on my star fixing and after hour hour, hour and a half I got one triangle and it was big. It was big. And that bothered me. I said, man, I supposed to be that big. Then I started work, and mind you, it was cold. You were flying at 
say 25,000 feet and it's cold. And you have to have, you're wearing oxygen mask and you're wearing heavy gloves, heavy clothing, and you're gasping for breath. <sighs> you know. I took a second fix, and it too was big, but it showed me we're drifting north. We're going north of where we're supposed to be, and I kind of got alarmed. Then I worked in another hour or two, I had a third fix, and it too showed me we were drifting 150, 200 miles north of where we were supposed to be tracking. And I remember going up to the pilot and telling him, I said, hey Rube, these don't look good. They're, they're, the plane is so bouncy, it's difficult, it's cold. And, but this is all we got. I said, I did the best we could. And it shows me that we're 200, 250 miles, 200, 250 miles north of where we're supposed to be. And I said, if this is right, we're going to go past the British Isles and we're going to land somewhere in the North Pacific. Now, if it's wrong and we make the correction I'm going to recommend, we're going to go into France, occupied France. But I said, it's all we got, and we're going to have to go on it. He said, okay, Mitch. He said, you've done the best you can. So I gave him about a 35 or 40 degree correction to the right. And we flew that for a ways sometime. And then lo and behold, they had a, on the, uh, Irish coast, they had a, uh, a radio direction beam that they would send out into the Pacific, hopefully for the planes to pick up. And they, they sent the radio direction beam out. And when we got within hearing distance of that, we were pretty close. We made a small correction. But the, ra the radio engineer picked that signal up and told us we were coming in where we were supposed to on the Irish coast. Well, I remember uh, the sun was up then, the sun was coming up, and I took a shot on the sun and got a LOP. And then I used that radio direction signal for the other LOP, and where they crossed was where we were. And then I estimated the mileage into Ireland, and I gave the guys an ETA, which estimated time of arrival. And I missed it two minutes. Those guys thought I was the best navigator in the world. They didn't know how scared I was. <laughs> how they didn't know how far off we had got before we made the that was one of the scariest nights of my life. It was so cold and I was so tired, scared, afraid. There was a lot of, uh, the, the U.S. lost a lot of planes ferrying, ferrying across the North Atlantic. Not long ago I read about, uh, I think there was, oh, maybe ten planes that was, took off at the same time and they hit storms. And most of the planes decided to go down to lower altitude and go down closer to the ocean. And uh, one or two of them started climbing. And those that went down, they never heard of them again. Those that tried to lose altitude and get below the storm, they never heard of them. And those that climbed made it. And so we lost a, we lost a lot of planes very Well, after we landed at Prestwick, Scotland, uh, we went to uh, one base where we only stayed a week or two. I can't remember the name of that base. And then we went to uh, Snetterton Heath. you got to get your mouth just right to say Snetterton, S-N-E-T-T-E-R-O-N, Heath. Uh, 
this was close to the uh, fabled Robin Hood forest that you read about. That was just a story, but I think the name of the forest was the Robin Hood. And there was where we uh, where we did our uh, where we took off and did our combat missions. Uh, one of the first, I guess, it was the first combat mission that we flew on. I was sick. Again, I had ear problems. My ears were bothering me, and I was in the hospital with them. And so I didn't get to take off with the crew that day. I was very unhappy because I, I wanted to do so, and I didn't get to do so. Well, uh, one of the planes in our, we had, we had a, each field had a, a bombardment group, a heavy bombardment group, and we had four squadrons. My bombardment group was the 96th, and I was 413th squadron. Each squadron had about uh, 12 air crews, so in the base you would have maybe 48, 48 air crews. Uh, one of the uh, other squadrons uh, the gunner was what they call clearing their guns. That they just kind of checking their guns out. 50 caliber machine gun. And one of them, his uh, waist gunner, his, his gun was supposed to be fixed so it didn't swivel that far. But he was checking his gun and swiveled it around and shot off the vertical stabilizer the old 17, the tail, big tail, shot it off. Well, the plane was very, very hard to hold in the air without that vertical stabilizer. So the, pi uh, the pilot and co-pilot flew, made a circle or two, a couple of circles, and bailed their crew out. And then the pilot, he didn't want to he, he couldn't he couldn't bring it into the uh, he couldn't control it enough to bring it into the airport air base and after he bailed his crew out he bailed he, he tried to tie his plane up he found something to try to tie it up to where it would where he, he and the co-pilot could get out and the co-pilot got out okay and the pilot by the time he could get out, he was over the North Sea. Now, the North Sea is on the east coast of England. It's, it, the North Sea lies between mainland Europe and the British Isles. He bailed out into the North Sea, and they found him about an hour later. He had found a boy to cling to, but he was dead. You could last, the North Sea was cold. You could last about 20 or 25 minutes in the North Sea before hypothermia got to you. So they found him dead, clinging to a boy. Uh, that, was a, that was a failure. They never did get to the target and they turn around and come back. I, I've forgotten the details, but that, that mission didn't count. It didn't count as a mission. It was a failure. And the uh, CO, the commanding officer, was very, very unhappy about it. He was a tough old bird. His name was Archie Oles. And he was a colonel then, but later became three-star general. He really rimmed his pilots out. He was very unhappy. Uh, <coughs> some of the other missions, some of the, <coughs> some of the missions weren't too tough. Maybe we'd go into occupied France, and uh, going into occupied France wasn't as bad as flying over Germany. Uh, 
sometimes we would go to the sub bins. Uh, Germans had sub bins on the French coast, and you would go to them. And so all of your missions weren't, some of them were a lot harder than others. You would have a lot more opposition than uh, you did on others. Uh, I've got a uh, diary here. I won't, I won't try to go through it or anything. Our waste gunner kept a very, I kept a diary myself, but it just extended through Brooks's birthday for some odd reason. I don't know why. I kept a diary until I received word from the United States that Brooks had arrived. And after that, I quit. I don't know. But Lakey, one of the waste gunners, kept a complete diary. Very good, very detailed diary. He would write every night after a combat tour, combat raid, he would write his diary down. And Florence Lakey, his widow, sent me that here a few months ago. I have it here. I, I, mailed, I made a copy of it and mailed it to Brooks. But it details our, uh, our missions. Uh, some of the missions that I I remember distinctly uh, I think it was Pinamunda we were going to Pinamunda which is a submarine pen on the Baltic German German submarine pen and uh, there was a lot of planes out perhaps 250 planes and I remember distinctly getting into Europe and uh, seeing two cloud, two cloud covers come together. We were flying over one cloud cover and there was one above us. We were flying between, but you could look out and see those two cloud layers coming together. And that dumb so-and-so that was leading us led us right into when they came together. And you can imagine having 200 B-17s flying in thick clouds. Rube, our pilot, was a very good pilot. He didn't panic. That was one thing. Rube could keep his head. And I remember Rube slamming those throttles forward and taking off on a wing climbing. He was trying to get away from the rest of the 17s. He climbed and then he then he started home. He turned around because he couldn't, couldn't see any other planes. And uh, we then all, all of them did. They just scattered like a flock of quail. The planes scattered everywhere. We lost, we lost some and cracking into each other. And we started home, and uh, the Germans knew what had happened. They were after us. The fighters, German fighters, were after us because they, they realized what had happened, that we had been. And the pilots then, they began to gather back into formation. They forgot. Generally, they flew with their own group, but not this time. Every time one, one plane could see another one, they would they'd start they come together and start flying in formation. Those blamed German fighters were out there pot shooting us. Some Yunkers 88s, they were uh, twin engine and had the cannon. They, uh, I remember, they hit, hit one of our planes and uh, knocked the uh, the planes had life rafts, rubber life rafts on the sides of them. If you had to ditch them in the water, maybe you could get those life rafts loose and get them, hopefully. But a bullet hit that plane thing and it knocked it back on the vertical stabilizer and the rubber, rubber life raft wrapped around the stabilizer and sent that plane plane into a steep spin. And the old plane was spinning out of control going down into the North Sea. 
several of the guys bailed out and were lost, never heard from them again. One of my good friends, Lambert, the bombardier, he bailed out. Some of them couldn't get out. When those old planes went into a steep spin, the, uh, the uh, gravity, you know, they'd spin and the gravity would throw you back and, and gravitational force and you couldn't get out. Well, Lambert got out, two of the other fellows got out, we never heard from him. Well, the pilot, he managed to bring that thing under control after losing several thousand feet. And uh, managed to limp home with that old thing. And uh, as it came in landing, one of the props fell off and cut the nose in two. Cut the nose right in two. Luckily, there wasn't anybody left with the nose. They were all but that was one of the main missions I remember, and I always felt felt hard toward whoever was leading us that they could be dumb enough to lead us in between two cloud layers. Um, one of the other missions that I remember particularly was that uh, we were uh, the Germans had concentrated their uh, ball bearing men factory in Schweinfurt, around a town named Schweinfurt. And uh, it was odd to me that they would do this, you know, because the ball bearings were such an integral part of the war effort. They were used in so many different things. But they did, and so we were, the 8th Air Force was going after the ball bearing works. We sent out 300 planes that day, uh, two wings, we, they went in two wings. A wing was made up of several groups, several bombardment groups consist made up of wing. And one wing went into Swineford, and our, uh, our group was with the second wing, and we went to Regensburg, where they uh, manufactured uh, Messerschmitts and Baca Wolves. Baca Wolf and Messerschmitt was two of the better fighter planes. And so we were going down and bombed the uh, fighter manufacturer. Uh, that was one of the toughest raids of that, of that, uh, of that year. We lost uh, 60 out of 300. We lost 20%. 2,000 2, men on that one raid. Uh, we went, after we hit Regensburg, we crossed the Mediterranean and went into North Africa. That was the first shuttle type. They called it a shuttle raid. That was the first shuttle raid made. We spent about two weeks in uh, North Africa and loaded up and hit some sub fins on the French coast and then on back in back into England. But that was a very, very uh, tough raid. Uh, the United States was beginning to be doubtful if they could continue daylight bombing after that raid. They started putting flame dampeners on their planes and so that if when we flew at night, our planes wouldn't be too visible with flame dampeners. See, the RAF bombed at night, and we bombed at day. The RAF didn't do daylight bombing. They did night bombing, and we did daylight bombing. But I know later I heard that there was a lot of discussion going on. Can the United States afford to keep up daylight bombing, afford this kind of losses? And they decided that they could. So they did continue daylight bombing. Uh, there were a lot of tough raids. Uh, we were, our, our squadron was very fortunate. I don't know how it happened, but uh, two or three years ago, I talked with our squadron CO at one of our reunions. And we took over 12 air crews, and we only lost one. The rest of them made their 25. 
but then later on during the war that 96 took a heavy heavy beating um, I was reading somewhere that we uh, with the second there was 45 there was 45 heavy bombardment groups and out of the 45 we took the second heaviest loss our group but uh, we were we were fortunate. We got uh, we got shot up real bad one time. The uh, I forget we were raiding somewhere in occupied France, and we were under fighter attack. And evidently, in our group, we had some green gunners, as you would lose air crews, the uh, replacement crews. We had some green gunners. We were under fighter attack, and we were flying what we call tail end Charlie. That was bad. Uh, your tail end Charlie meant that your your squadron was flying the lowest. They they would they had positions that each group or each squadron would fly in. We were flying at the low point and the back point. Low back point was tailing Charlie, and uh, they the, they arranged it so that you didn't have to fly that too often because none of the pilots liked it because it it was the worst worst spot. The, the fighter planes would pick on you. Well, we were flying tailing Charlie, and one of our own gunners we figured out kept his trigger finger on the trigger too long. And just shot the daylights out of us. It shot shot out the pilot's controls. The old 17 had dual controls. The co-pilot and the pilot had separate controls. And it shot out the pilot's controls. And the old plane fell over and started down. And me and the bombardier knew we'd been hit. We didn't know how bad it was, but we knew we'd been hit. And we both had our, uh, this is a continuation of uh, the last tape I was telling Amanda about one of her missions in which one of her own gunners shot us up, uh, shot the uh, pilot's controls out, and uh, he thought that we were uh, going down. The plane lurched and started into a slow spin, and uh, he was trying to put it on automatic pilot so we could bail out. Well, the bombardier and I, we were already, we knew the plane had been hit and we were losing altitude and it was at an odd, odd angle. So we had our uh, hands on the trap door there and our parachutes already and just ready to go. Uh, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't leave a plane without your plane commander telling you to because that was desertion if you did. So we were all waiting for the pilot to uh, tell us to get out. Well, we didn't know it, but uh, uh, Rube was screaming at us, get out, get out, to the whole crew. Uh, the only thing was his throat mic was off his throat, and none of us could hear him. Well, the co-pilot had a hard time getting Rube's attention to show him that he still had the control. But he finally got Rube's attention, showed him had control, showed him we had control. And we limped home then. We dropped down and uh, dropped down to low altitude and flew across France, flew across the channel and flew into home. But our plane was uh, shot up pretty badly. Uh, that might have been the time that they made a hangar queen out of that one. Uh, Actually, the plane that we finished on was uh, Kipling's Air the Third, and we lost the one with the wing I was telling about in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And then we lost, we got the other one shot up real bad, and I think this was a mission that uh, we had to make a hangar queen out of her. Uh, Kind of a just an example of what the what the mission was like from finish to end. 
I have here a uh, diary. Uh, Lakey, one of the uh, waste gunners, he kept a rather uh, rather complete diary of all 25 missions that we did. And uh, Florence Lakey, his uh, widow, was kind enough to send me a copy of it, and I'll start reading the diary. Got up at 1.45, ate breakfast at 2.30, briefed at 3.15. Sky was real clear due to a full moon. Clean guns for the light of a flashlight. Our ship was first standby ship just before the last ship took off. One of the earlier ones to have taken off flew over the field with one prop feathered. We got the go-ahead signal, warmed up the engines, piled in our flying equipment, taxied up to the runway in one big hurry, gunned the engines for a few seconds, pushed the throttles forward, and away, and away we went for a beautiful takeoff, which was at 5.15. While Lieutenant Nye was catching up to the formation, we were dressing. By the time he caught up, which was about 20 minutes after taking off, we were dressed and ready for action, which we got more than later. Staff Sergeant Novi flew again in Nelson's place. About 50 miles out from the English coast, it started to get cloudy. The farther we flew, the cloudier it got. Uh, we fired our guns about, about 50 miles out from the English coast. All guns okay. Lieutenant Nye was having trouble with one of the engines, but told us in his reassuring manner, Everything was under control, which it was. We put our oxygen mask on about one hour before hitting the German coastline. We kept climbing until we were 27,000 feet high, and the clouds below us were almost a solid mass. Our lead bombardier was taking a chance that Hamburg would not be so cloudy. To our disappointment, it was a solid mass of clouds. We turned back a few miles before we thought we would get there. Visibility above the clouds was unlimited. The sun was very bright. The enemy fighters hit us just as we got over the islands before flying over the mainland. At one time, we saw about 40 fighters. They would climb way up above us, come in at our tails, out of the sun, four to six at a time, shooting and twisting at the same time. Joe and Novi claimed a plane apiece. We, uh, the flashes from their guns looked like their leading edge of the wing was on fire. Those old 20 millimeter can really sling the lead. I didn't get very many good shots because another group was on their left wing. We also had some flak shot at us for a few seconds as we got a little glimpse of the islands. It was very inactive. Fighters stayed with us for about 45 minutes, pouring lead into us, but they got the worst of it. I saw three of their planes go down in fire, and only one of ours went down that I saw. Several of those boys bailed out, though. About five minutes before the fighters left us, they flew around us like a bunch of angry hornets. They always do. Lieutenant Shelton, who was flying on our right wing, suddenly pulled out of formation. We did not know it at the time, but a life draft was jammed loose by the top turret. It hit the horizontal stabilizer, damaging it, so to make it go into a steep dive of about several thousand feet. Also, doing the loop at the same time. It pulled out of it quite a ways below us. Now the number two engine went haywire. So it started to dive again. Just as it started to dive, four of the boys hit the silk. Manley, Ridge Runner, Frank Gorman, Atlanta Peach, uh, Molly, Static Hoppy, and Lieutenant Coffey the bombardier. All these boys were and still are, wherever they may be, darn good pals of mine. 
We were together for so long, just before we took off, the ship being parked next to our did some friendly joking. Uh, now, nine hours later, they're no longer with us. Our hope is they were picked up by the Germans because they bailed out about 10 miles out of Germany rather than freezing to death in the North Sea. I believe everyone that saw them bail out said a little prayer of some kind. I know I did. After these four bailed out, Lieutenant Shelton, by some miracle, brought the ship under control. The rest of the crew was ready to bail out. It was brought under control just in time. He flew back with three good engines minus his four men. In the meantime, our number three engine conked out. We also struggled back, uh, back home, Lieutenant Nye doing a marvelous job of flying. On the trip back home, we were uh, rather blue because after seeing those four boys bail out and their ship disappear into the clouds, we gave them up as being lost. At that time, we did not know it was under control as it went through the cloud. Lieutenant Shelton told us this after we landed. While all this was going on, Novi froze several fingers on his left hand. It was about 30 below up there. We had a tough time of it to keep from freezing our feet and hands. Our feet were numb with cold. Novi was almost in tears. It was painting him so. We uh, both took a few minutes off from our post. The fight was over. I took off my gloves and rubbed his hand for about 15 minutes and had to give up because both of mine were getting stiff. So I gave him my gloves and I put hip on his. In a little while, we were down to 5,000 feet. We worked on his hand for a while longer until the uh, danger of the entire hand freezing was past. Only several fingers were numb when we landed. I haven't seen him since. He went to the hospital. Sure hope it's only frostbite instead of several frozen fingers. We'll know more about him later. We landed at 11.30. We were the last ship to land. We taxied into our parking space, had our flying equipment out, ready to leave for the interrogation room. When in comes Lieutenant Shelton, whom all of us had given up for lost. Everyone on the field stopped whatever they were doing. I'll uh, read one more page out of, one more sequence out of uh, Lakey's diary. And this happened on July 28, 1943. It was the 15th mission we flew. Got up at 1.30, breakfast at 2. Not so very good. Brief 2.30, clean guns and low ammunition by aid of a flashlight. Our ship just came into commission at midnight, and the bombs were loaded, completely loaded, a few minutes before takeoff. Put on my heavy underwear and socks just before takeoff. Uh, we're the last plane to take off because we were tail end Charlie again, flying on Captain Flagg's left wing. Since early last night, the RAF kept up a steady hum going over into Germany. When we got up, the searchlights were on, searching the clouds for them to guide them to their home base. At one time, I saw 15 bright paths of light searching the clouds. We put on our oxygen mask when about two hours after takeoff. Takeoff is at 545. We hit altitude a few, mi few miles off the German coast. The weather was very cloudy. When we uh, neared the German coast, the clouds were very dense, just about the time we were to have gone into Germany. The fighters hit us, diving at us out of the clouds. They raised Holy Cain with us there in the clouds while we were fighting them off. The clouds got so thick and heavy that we could not see the plane in front of us. So in the next few minutes, not being able to see a plane, everyone broke formation for safety's sake and scattered for several miles. 
It was one hell of a grand mix-up with about 80 planes out of formation lost in dense clouds. It's a miracle we came through it. Several times we fell a couple of hundred feet almost out of control. But again, our pilot, Lieutenant Nye, pulled us through with some darn good cooperation from our co-pilot, Lieutenant Asper. Two darn good boys. Just before we hit the dense clouds as the fighters, about 75 of them, kept pouring on the lead. I saw three forts behind us, a little above, explode in the air while still in formation. It seems the lead ship was hit in the bomb bay, setting the incendiary bombs off. No one in that ship knew what hit them. The explosion was so terrific it blew the ship all to pieces, hitting the other two wing ships, setting them on fire. All three ships went down in a mass of flames, a very sickly sight to see. As we came out of the clouds, we saw 17s all over the sky. Some were dropping their incendiary bombs all over the coastline in order to get more speed. We kept our bomb load. All the planes were loaded with 12 100-pound and 6 500-pound incendiary bombs, a very dangerous load to carry. When the fighters left us, I saw a 17 ditch about 75 miles from the German coast. Lieutenant Moore ditched about 50 miles from the English coastline. We should hear from him in a day or two if they all got out, which we hope they did, and it turned out that they didn't. Huey Moore was his name, and his navigator was a, a good friend of mine, Monroe Coleman, and we never heard from that crew again. All told, we lost eight forts on this raid, our biggest loss so far. Most of these crews were knocked down near Germany. No telling when and if we ever hear from them. We flew at 18,000 feet. The trip home wasn't any to cheer, wasn't any too cheerful. Ships from five different groups flew in our formation. That's how bad the mix-up really was. We landed at 11.45, packed our clothes, found several holes in the fuselage, very small, ship still in commission, had a spam sandwich and cocoa, interrogated, went out and cleaned my gun. After supper, I'll be ready to hit the hay. Sunny and warm on ground, sun, sun bath while writing these pages. About one time when the flak penetrated the nose. I don't remember what mission it was on, but uh, I was uh, bent over working on my maps trying to figure out where we were and how to get home. And uh, this uh, piece of uh, an aircraft came through the hull of the plane and came right across where I was sitting above me and dropped. It was pretty much, the velocity of it was pretty much spent at that time. Uh, I doubt if it would kill me if it would have hit me, but it, I'm sure it would have, wouldn't have been any fun. Uh, I kept that piece of flak for years and years and years, but I have no idea now where it is. We finished our uh, 25th mission uh, sometime about the middle of September 1943. We had a real, real good squadron commander. His name was uh, Stanley Han. And Stanley did everything he could to uh, nurse his flight crews through 25. Uh, for the first 20 missions, you just, it was kind of catch as catch can. Uh, you, you just took the missions. Any, any, he, he was the one that would select which one of his air crews or how many of his air crews would go out on a given mission. And until you got 20, why, well, he had just, uh, he'd just put you in when it come your turn. And then he made a practice of, after you got 20 missions done, Stanley wouldn't put you out on the tough one. He would, uh, if you had a real long mission going deep into Germany, 
uh, Stanley would hold you back. And then when one came along going into occupied France, well, you'd take that one. So you can, you can imagine how his air crews really loved him for that. And as I say, we finished up in September. And then it wasn't long, I don't know, a week or two, maybe less, until uh, the pilot and I uh, caught a uh, C-54. That was a big transport plane, and uh, it had some empty space going back to New York. So Rube and I uh, went back to New York then, and we got to, I remember, we got to the air, one of the uh, air bases there in New York, and there was a B-54, a B-24, it was going over to Omaha. They were just a stateside crew that was flying the uh, B-24 around to get ours. And they had, one, they had one vacancy on the plane and one parachute. So me and another old boy, I don't remember his name, but we, we tossed a coin to see which one got to ride that uh, uh, B-24 over to Omaha, Nebraska, and sure enough, I got it. So I rode the thing then to Omaha, and I called uh, I called Mabel from there and told her where I was at and to look for me that I would uh, it wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be long till I'd be home. And uh, so the 24 pilot, he was a nice guy. He didn't intend to go to Tulsa. He was going somewhere else, and I told him I was just coming back from England and trying to get home. And he said, oh, shoot, I'm just, we're just flying around, getting flying hours. He said, I'll fly you down to Tulsa. So we stayed, uh, stayed in Omaha. And I remember I couldn't get over the lights. See, in, in England, why, at night, everything was blacked out. I mean, it was totally blacked out in England. And... Uh, the lights in Omaha were so bright, and when, that night when I called Mabel, well, I was telling her how bright the lights were. And so then the next day, sure enough, we flew to uh, flew to Tulsa. And I remember locating from the air. I could locate. I knew where we lived, where Mabel was living. Uh, there was some some real good friends of ours named Brown, Kate, Kate and Ernest Brown, and they had a little one-bedroom apartment behind their house. So they had rented it to Mabel and I. And uh, Mabel and Brooks, Brooks was two months old. This was October 43. They lived there. Well, I, I had the pilot circle that a couple of times at kind of a low altitude and let her know that that was me and come out to the airport to pick me up. So we landed at the airport there in Tulsa and Mabel was there. And you can imagine what a glad reunion that was. And she had left the baby with uh, Kate Brown, and I remember when we uh, when we drove home, why uh, she said, uh, "Oh Lord, come look what we got!" And he was the cutest little old thing you ever saw. Getting home, why? Uh, I had a week or two leave, and then the Air Force shipped me to uh, Tucson, Arizona, to Davis Monthan Air Base, and I was a navigation instructor there. And lo and behold, I wasn't there but two or three months, and I got orders to go to Pueblo, Colorado, and to join a group, bomb group, that was going to the Pacific. And man, was I ever shook up, you know. I thought, I thought I'm home for good. And here they are, just after two or three months, shipping me off again. And I was so mad. And I applied for leave, and I didn't even wait to get my leave approved. Uh, Mabel was with me and Brooks. And so we just went home to Tulsa for a couple of weeks. And I thought, well, I'll, they'll probably count me AWOL and, and, and punish me. But after two weeks, I went on back to Pueblo, Colorado. Well, wouldn't you know, 
that group had found another navigator and they had taken off and gone on and there I was left at Pueblo, Colorado and that was the best time I had in the Air Force. I was the uh, head uh, navigation ground instructor. Pueblo was what they called a three-phase training base and uh, new crews that had just formed would come in and would get experience uh, in navigation and in uh, bombing and uh, that type of thing. And so I was one of the uh, staff there on the base. And I got to stay there a whole year. And boy, that was, that was good duty. Well, after a year, after a year was up, or before, about a time when the year was up, uh, they needed uh, lead navigators for B-29 groups, and they started putting the heat on me. Mitchell, uh, we're going to put you on a B-29 and be the lead navigator. Well, that didn't suit me at all. I thought, my goodness, here I've had one, com suffered through one combat tour, and why should I go through another one when hundreds of air crews in the United States haven't been into one yet? So I started casting around to see what I could kill time doing. Well, they were also training return navigator bombardier as pilots, B-29 pilots is what we were being trained for. So I put in my application to go back through pilot training school. And luckily, I was accepted. Well, uh, <clears throat> I went to uh, went back to Kelly Field a little while for processing and paperwork and all that. And then uh, they uh, shipped shipped us to Chickasha, Oklahoma, for primary flight training. And uh, that was it. Took about seemed like it took about two and a half three months for primary. And Mabel and I rented a nice little home there in Chickasha, and that was a good experience going through that. And then uh, I went to uh, basic flight training at uh, Sherman Denison, Texas. There was a uh, air, uh, air base just uh, west of Sherman, and uh, Mabel went back uh, went back to Tulsa for this. She was uh, pregnant with Marty. Marty was due in a couple of months or so. And uh, so she went back to Tulsa to our little, we kept our little apartment at the Browns there. And I was flying, uh, flying AT-6s for basic. Uh, I remember one incident. Uh, I had been up to visit with uh, visit with Mabel and over a weekend hadn't slept much I guess I hadn't I don't know I hadn't slept a couple of hours maybe in the last 24 I was just dead on my feet well I went over to uh, had an auxiliary base there and those uh, for the AT6s and I was shooting landings I remember and I was coming in for a landing and the tower started screaming at me, go around, go around. And I gunned it and took off, didn't touch the ground, took took off again. And the guy started screaming at me, you were coming in with your wheels up. You had didn't have your wheels down. What do you mean? So I went around and shot another landing or two and then come back in and second time, go around. And... Uh, didn't have my wheels down again. Well, the next day, you can imagine the CO. I had a notice that CO wants to see you. So I went in to the old colonel's office, tried to explain to him my wife was very, very close to having a baby, and I was just dog tired. I hadn't had any sleep for so long, and I was just, I shouldn't have told him I shouldn't have been flying. I should have, shouldn't have let shouldn't let him put me in a plane but so he he understood and he didn't didn't wash me out or he didn't 
didn't penalize me. Well, uh, I remember it was while I was there uh, flying AT-6s that Marty came, and she was born in Tulsa. And uh, I can, somehow or other, we thought we were having twins, thought Mabel was having twins. And I remember as I rode the bus from Sherman to Tulsa that I thought, well, we're going to have going to have little twins this time. Yeah, it wasn't. It was Marty. Uh, Mabel, you can imagine, she was tickled to death because her first child had been a boy and she wanted a girl the worst way. And she, she vowed and declared, now if this is a boy, then we'll have another child and it'll be a girl. Well, it turned out to be a girl, and Mabel was overjoyed. Uh, then when I completed my uh, basic training at uh, Sherman, I was sent to Enid and to fly B-25 bombers. And uh, that was the, uh, what to call the uh, advanced flying school. And we got a, we got an upstairs uh, apartment in it. It was a rat trap. And uh, I remember the uh, our landlady, she was an old witch, and uh, she would come into our place and prowl around and look around. And I remember we'd dust, we'd dust flour out in the hallway so we could see her tracks if she came in. And <laughs> This was the summertime. It was July and August of 45, and it was so hot. And that upstairs apartment was just terribly, terribly hot. But just the fact that we could be together, why, we would put up with anything. And uh, so I almost, uh, almost didn't quite complete my advanced flying training. I had a number of uh, first pilot hours in the 25, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of hours, first pilot in the 25. It seemed to me like we lacked about two weeks of completing our flying training. And then, of course, they, uh, we heard that they dropped the atomic bomb. This was in September of 45. Well, we couldn't believe it. You know, we thought this is just another, another bit of propaganda. We, of course, we kept hearing and through the papers that it wouldn't be long till the war was over and Japan was going to surrender. And we absolutely couldn't believe it. But that's the way it happened. Uh, after they dropped the second atomic bomb, why, uh, Japan then surrendered and the war was over. And I did not put another step into an airplane after that to fly it. Uh, seemed to me like some guys got the bug and flying was living to them. They, they didn't think they were living unless they were flying, not me. Uh, I had had, <coughs> I'd had too many close encounters with death and uh, wanted, to, uh, wanted to be a father to my wife and uh, father, a husband to my wife, father to my children. And uh, I was so pleased. I've never been as happy about anything as when the war was over and I didn't have to crawl back into those old tin birds again. Uh, Amanda asked me to relate a story I had told her about uh, landing and glasses. When I uh, first got into the uh, Air Force back in 1940, well, it was 40, I, I went in in early 42, but I took my uh, physical test in uh, late 41. Uh, it turned out that on my eye test, uh, I had a 2020 and a 2030, and a 2020 was demanded to uh, get into the cadet program. So uh, I was telling her a story. Uh, I took my eye test at Will Rogers Air Base here in Oklahoma City. Uh, I had done real good, and it was noontime, and I remember the doctor saying to me, Now, son, you've done so good on all your tests up to this point. 
you you flunked your eye test, but uh, let's uh, it's lunchtime. Let's break for lunch, and we'll come back, and I'll retest you. Maybe you can uh, maybe you can pass it. Well, as I went out that room, I glanced up and saw the room number, and I gulped my lunch, ate my lunch hurriedly, slipped back into that room memorized that uh, eye chart, the 2020 line, and I was telling her I've never forgotten that. R, date, or DCNB is the 2020 line on the chart it was then. So I passed the test. Well, uh, then for, they would give you tests occasionally then, after getting in, they would give you tests for eye charts. And I sort of sweet talked and bribed the sergeants, generally it was the sergeant giving you, letting you read the chart. And uh, that worked until uh, Enid, and I had a tough hard-boiled doctor, and he gave me a test on that eye chart, and I flunked it. And I remember him saying to me, uh, son, there's two things going to happen. You're going to quit flying unless you get glasses. So I thought, well, no, I, I don't want to quit flying because I'm killing time here. Uh, instead of having to go back overseas, I'm, I'm killing some good time, so I'll, I'll choose the getting glasses. He fitted me up with glasses. I didn't realize what was happening. It, it threw my depth perception off. And <clears throat> I remember going out for a check ride with a check instructor. And he had me shooting landings, and I had my blame glasses on. And I was bringing that old 25 in to land it. And it's got tricycle landing gear, and you've got to land on your two main wheels. And then when your two main wheels hit, you pull the stick back into your belly, and then as the plane loses speed, the nose wheel drops. Well, this time I, I couldn't see, the, I couldn't tell where the ground was, and I landed that thing, all three wheels at the same time. A terrible jolt, a jar, and the check instructor started screaming at me and wondering how in the world I'd got this far. He was a lieutenant, I was a captain, so I just looked over at him and grinned and said, ah, oh, I think I know what happened. I pulled my glasses off and put them in my pocket, took it around again and just greased it in, did that two or three times. So I satisfied him that I knew how to land one of those B-25s. Well, this, was, uh, this story then is up till September 45 when the war was over and immediately after the war was over uh, I hightailed it down to Stillwater which is just a short distance from Enid and uh, Mabel and I found a little uh, two bedroom home right on the railroad tracks we didn't mind that uh, so we could rent until I could uh, complete my uh, schooling and I remember this was uh, little frame two bedroom had a nice garden out back and we gardened and then there was a railroad right with the garden there so uh, went to school this September 45 uh, I didn't get uh, completely out of the uh, didn't get completely out of the uh, Air Force uh, I was uh, decommissioned at uh, Fort Smith Arkansas big base down there in October. So I really didn't get started to back to Stillwater until October of 45, but of course they were being very generous with the veterans then, and they were glad to accept me even though I was two or three weeks late. I st uh, Mabel and I stayed in Stillwater then um, until uh, 48. See, yeah, it was uh, 47, 48. I got my uh, bachelor's degree in uh, January, January 47. Got my bachelor's degree in January 47. 
And then I decided I would stay on at Stillwater and get a master's degree in agronomy uh, or soils. Agronomy is a combination of field crops and soils, and I was majoring in, in soils. But then uh, come the uh, late fall of uh, 47, early, early part of 48, we had a chance to uh, go over to Guthrie and teach veterans. They had a, had a program going that uh, the uh, veterans could enroll in, and they, they paid them, and they could take so many hours, had to come to school so, so many times a week, and then the instructor, he would, uh, he would go out on the farm with them and help them, uh, help them and teach them how to do things on the farm. So that was $300 a month. Boy, that was big money. Uh, going to school in Stillwater, I got uh, $90 a month. And uh, so you didn't have much money left over the time you paid your room and the time you paid your tuition. And, I, I worked at everything possible while I was up there. I worked in the soils lab, and uh, then I'd go out and hunt jobs up, uh, washing windows, cleaning houses, doing things like that. I remember the day I was supposed to graduate, in January 47, I'd made an appointment with a woman to come and clean all her windows, and Mabel had to remind me that that was graduation day, so... I called her up and went out and cleaned her windows a, another day. But it, it wasn't easy getting through, but it, it was uh, hard work. Um, I remember one summer, one semester, I took uh, 22 hours. I had to get special permission to do that. But I got special permission and took 22 hours one semester so I could uh, graduate. And uh, anyhow, um, I uh, we went to move to Guthrie and stayed a few months, and then we uh, got a job with the Bureau of Indian Affairs as a soil conservationist, and uh, that was a that was a neat job. Um, I, uh, despite having uh, two children and uh, working at different hours, I did rather well in school. Um, I was selected uh, the honorary Alpha Zeta, which is an honorary agricultural fraternity, and also I was uh, Phi Kappa Phi, which is the upper 10% of the graduates. So uh, I worked hard, and, uh, and most of the veterans did. They were older then, and a lot of us had families, and so we wasn't fooling around. We we got we got busy, and we wanted to get out of there and get a job. Uh, then we went to move in '48. We moved to uh, Shawnee, and I was a soil conservationist. That was uh, the reason we went over there because we they had a nice home to offer us. And it was furnished, and uh, the houses that we'd lived in through the war and immediately after the war, we were overjoyed to have a nice home to live in. So went in over there and worked through uh, 48 and uh, through 49, not quite through 49, but uh, in uh, the fall of 49 got an offer to go to uh, Washington on a uh, training program. It was a real good offer. Uh, the Department of Interior uh, was starting this training program to take young men and train them to be, uh, to be administrators in the various bureaus of the department. There was only three of us selected over the entire United States. Uh, there were two Indian boys and myself. One of the Indian boys was Ernest Bowman. He was from Navajo, and Jose Zuni was uh, he was an Isleta Pueblo Indian. And the three of us then went to Washington in the fall of 1949. 
and we stayed there for uh, about six months and uh, it was good training we uh, got to kick around and work in different offices and work in different bureaus of the interior department and uh, then after then we went out uh, for field training six months for field training Mabel and I went to Oregon we went to Portland Oregon and we spent about uh, Spent about uh, six months field training there, and then I uh, was assigned permanent duty in Aberdeen. Uh, I remember just before uh, in '49, uh, Mabel was expecting Sarah, and uh, we'd go to the doctor, and I was real hesitant about uh, about her going with me, but uh, Sarah had arrived. And she, her birthday is August 1 of 49. And uh, she, I think she was about a month old, just about a month old when we went to uh, Washington. We had a little old uh, Ford coupe, and it was a small thing and an undependable car and uh, had a lot of trouble with it. And uh, I remember we couldn't afford nice motels. We'd uh, stay wherever we could, and we'd let Sarah sleep in the drawer. She was that small. We'd open the drawer of the dresser, and she'd sleep in the drawer. Uh, completing the uh, rather intensive training in Washington, D.C., uh, my boss, Evan Flory, he was head of the uh, Soil and Moisture Conservation Department of the Bureau. He gave me a double promotion. Now that is something that was unheard of. I, I, I'm sure it happened before, but I didn't know of it happening. I was a grade nine, and he jumped me to a grade 11. And man, that was some jump in salary. So I jumped at the chance, and he sent me to uh, Aberdeen Area Office as the area soil scientist. Now, um, I had had, my training was in soils. I had two degrees, had two in soils, uh, masters. But I never had did any soils mapping, and I was kind of nervous about being thrown out like that. But it worked out. Uh, I found a guy that was a rather experienced soils mapper, and he showed me some of the tricks of uh, mapping soils. And I appreciated that. So uh, Mabel and I spent uh, five years in Aberdeen. We got up there on the 4th of July in 1950. And uh, I remember Sarah was quite small, just a few months old at that time. And we rented a house, uh, some little old house we, we could find, and rented it. And one thing I remember was this was in August. Then in August, we got up there in July, then in August, had a nice garden. Somebody that had rented the house in front of us had, had some real nice tomatoes, and they were big, old, luscious green tomatoes. And I was real happy. I thought, boy, here we just fell into something. We're going to get a tomato crop. And wouldn't you know, on the 20th night of August, come a killing frost. And those blamed tomatoes all got killed. Well, uh, from that little house, we rented another house on the other part of town. It was a bigger house, and uh, it was a frame house, a nice house. But uh, it had an old coal-fired furnace, and uh, you would uh, hard to build a fire in, and you'd freeze to death till you got the thing going, and then when you got the furnace going, you'd burn you out of the house it was so hot and that was a real that was a real stinker that old coal-fired furnace and I was having to travel quite a little bit the Aberdeen area office had jurisdiction over North Dakota South Dakota and Nebraska and poor Mabel there she was left with uh, with the three children one of them a baby and two other small children and she had an awful time when I had to leave with that blame coal-fired furnace. Uh, then uh, 
one uh, it must have been about 51, I guess it was, they sent me down to the Rosebud Sioux Reservation to live down there for about a year. They had some special work they wanted me to do. So Mabel and I moved down to uh, the Rosebud. Uh, we had a, um, we first lived in an Indian boarding school. It was uh, three or four miles away from White River, South Dakota. And uh, there was a teacher, a teacher and his wife lived there, and then Mabel and I and the three children lived there. And that was kind of an experience, too, because it was isolated. And uh, the, I remember we didn't have, the only electricity was we had our own generators in the basement, and we'd have to get those flame generators started to have lights and to have power. Half the time they wouldn't work. That was a real traumatic thing. Uh, kids loved it. There was a, Brooks and Marty loved it. There was a river. The White River ran right behind the uh, boarding school. And they had big time playing in the river in the summertime. Then we moved from there. Uh, we're still on the Rosebud. We moved up to White River in a nurse's home. The home had been built for a, a, a nurse's home for the Bureau bacon and uh, that was uh, that was a lot better uh, we had a good time there at White River uh, I remember one incident uh, Mabel tells about it and it was kind of traumatic for her it was in October late October and it came a terrible snowstorm just a terrible snowstorm I was in Aberdeen which was a couple of hundred miles from there. And uh, I started home, and I couldn't get home. Uh, I was riding a bus, and I couldn't get home uh, because of snow, and we had to stay overnight. And Mabel was left there with, uh, with the children in a deep, deep snowstorm. And uh, luckily, uh, we, she had... Uh, the house was heated with propane gas, and she had gas. And she tells about uh, the kids trying to get home from school. And Brooks made it home, and Marty didn't make it home. And she was she was scared to death. It's just a short distance from the town, but she didn't know what to do, where to how to find Marty. Well, it happened that one of the one of the storekeepers saw Marty struggling to get home, and he stopped her and kept her and then got in touch with Mabel and told her that he had Marty and not to worry. But uh, that was a pretty scary times there. And from there we moved up to, uh, we stayed there about a year, and then we moved back up to uh, Aberdeen. And instead of moving into Aberdeen, we moved into Warner, which was a little town about uh, nine miles south of Aberdeen. And we moved into a rather uh, rather nice home, had a two-level home with a basement. And uh, that was the home that we finally bought. We lived in a little while, and we managed to buy it on a sales contract from the owner. And uh, that was a good experience there, living in Warner. Uh, I remember this was this would have been uh, in early '52. We moved up there in late '51, and in early '52, Mabel was expecting David, and uh, that was a terrible winter. The drifts were 10, 15 foot high in places. That was a terrible winter, and. Uh, so we didn't know it, but uh, the neighbors were planning on how they were going to get Mabel to the hospital. They had planned out there were several of them going to get together and by tractors and whatever take her to the hospital. Uh, the hospital was in Aberdeen. It's about nine miles away. But uh, sure enough, why uh, we did manage to get, when the time came, we got Mabel to the hospital and didn't have to resort to getting all the neighbors to help us. And uh, David was born then, and kind of funny, uh, 
Mabel went in and they were trying to find the doctor and they couldn't find a, couldn't locate the doctor well the baby baby came and the nurse was there to assist Mabel in having David and uh, so it turned out okay but then uh, she saw a little month or two later she saw the nurse on the street and the nurse remembered her very well because she told her she said you know said I wasn't going to tell you that your baby was the first one I ever helped deliver and uh, that kind of startled Mabel then <laughs> We lived in Aberdeen until uh, November of 1955. We had uh, bought this little house down in Warner, which was a small town just south of Aberdeen. Uh, Warner was primarily uh, Lutheran people, and uh, they were a little bit standoffish when we first moved in. We were foreigners, but uh, with Mabel's personality and it didn't take long for them to warm up to us. And we had really nice neighbors. They were very, very helpful and uh, very generous, and we really appreciated the little town of Warner. Um, I had to travel quite a lot in my work, the, uh, working with the uh, Aberdeen Area Office. They had jurisdiction over the reservations and Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota, which covered quite a quite a large area, and so uh, particularly in the spring and summer and fall, I imagine I'd be gone probably 75 percent of the time, and it was real tough on Mabel. She uh, she liked the area and that, but she did not like me being away from home so much, and her with all the children. In the winter time, I was home uh, most of the time, but winter time was bad. <coughs> was bad news for me because uh, my job was mapping soils, and in soils mapping, you have to uh, dig into the soil with the uh, auger, and the ground was frozen, and so that just knocked that in the head, and. Uh, Oftentimes, I did not have nearly enough to do at the office, and I got awfully restless. The uh, winter, the weather was delightful, except in the winters, and they were very cold. The uh, oftentimes the snow would start in October, and it wouldn't be over until uh, I imagine probably March. We had snow in March, and then we'd have the rest. Of the rest of the winter was uh, just delightful. The uh, growing season was kind of short. We had we raised good gardens every year we was up there, mostly cool crops. We'd raise uh, turnips and uh, potatoes and carrots and beans. I remember one time I planted okra and tried to raise okra. That, that was no go. Okra is a hot weather crop. It, it didn't do any good at all. But all in all, uh, it was a good experience for us. I tried to get out of there before I was able to because of the winters. And then uh, in 55, I had a chance to go to Anadarko. They were starting a real estate appraisal program in Anadarko, which was new to the Bureau. And uh, I had a good friend that had uh, transferred down there as the uh, area, Anadarko area officer. And so he brought me to uh, Anadarko to work in appraisals. That was, uh, I was the first appraiser in. And uh, then the program started uh, ballooning and uh, I probably had eight or ten appraisers under me there for the last few years. We covered the uh, whole western half of the state of Oklahoma and uh, also had one reservation in Kansas and we did all of the appraisal work. 
the uh, phrasing for the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs was a good job. It was a lot of variety. At that point in time, uh, a lot of the Indians were selling their allotments. Uh, we had to do lease appraisals for the allotments and uh, rights of ways, um, gift deeds, partitionments, and so it provided a, uh, a good deal of variety of appraisal work. Uh, there was a little bit of commercial, not too much. Mostly it was uh, farm ranch, raw land, uh, some residential. But all in all, it was a very good job. I had a real good, uh, for a while there, I had a real good boss, uh, Blen Waller, and I really appreciated him. We weren't there long till we bought uh, an old house, uh, 610, can't remember the street address, it was on a boulevard, 610 West Boulevard, I believe it was. It was an old house, it, it had been well kept, but it was small, probably 1,100 square feet, and just had one bathroom, and we made a three-bedroom out of it. It wasn't intended to be that way, but we made a three-bedroom out of it. It was uh, hot in the summer and cold in the winter. Didn't have any wall insulation. Uh, what it was, there was uh, lav tacked onto the tubifores and then uh, chicken wire put on the lav and then uh, had uh, plaster then put over the chicken wire and when the wind blew why, it came right through all the electrical outlets and uh, so it was kind of kind of a cold house we had uh, floor furnace and that wasn't too satisfactory it provided heat for a very local area and the kids got their feet burnt on it once in a while it would get pretty hot and then uh, in the summertime, we had uh, what we called a water cooler uh, for air conditioning. You would, uh, it was just a, a box, and it had a, a pad there, and, and the water would drip into the pad, and the wind would blow through the pad into the house. I remember when we first moved there, we turned that water cooler on and closed all the windows and doors. Well, that was the wrong thing to do because in the water cooler, you need to leave everything open. And we liked to, liked to smother it, but it, after a while, we learned how to do it. Uh, the kids remember that house probably the best as their home. Uh, David was three years old when we moved there. And um, Sarah was six, and Marty was ten, and uh, Brooks was Brooks was uh, twelve. I believe I believe that's right when we moved there. So uh, Brooks got to go through uh, part of junior high and then all of high school, and. Marty, she was in the uh, she was uh, let's see she was uh, ten years old so she had been about the third or fourth grade and she went through uh, went through all of elementary there and then went through high school there and David he he started the school there and. He was uh, in the tenth grade when we moved to Albuquerque in 1967. Uh, kids all seemed to like it. Anadarko was a pretty good town to raise a family in. Uh, it had uh, a large population of uh, uh, Indian kids, and Indian people, and uh, quite a large black population. And so there was a lot of uh, Indian children, black children, white children going to school there. Uh, 
uh, it was kind of a segregated town. It was a shame the way the uh, black people were treated. They, uh, it was a street that ran through town, and it was widely understood that the black people did not move to the other side of the street. They, they were restricted by uh, a street on the north and vacant land on the uh, a street on the west, vacant land on the north. Uh, they could land on the east. They had, uh, when we first moved there, they had uh, an elementary school of all black children, but uh, gratefully they changed that and the uh, black children started going to school with the white children then. I remember one incident. I belonged to the uh, Kiwanis Club and I was the uh, president of the chapter that year, and there was a big uh, question on how, whether to open the swimming pool or not to the black children, allow they just had one swimming pool in the park, and uh, the Kiwanis owned the swimming pool, so I remember very well, uh, it was a real close vote, we were voting on whether to allow the black children to use the swimming pool, and the vote was tied, and as president, I was able to vote and voted yes. And so we did open the uh, swimming pool in the park to the black kids. I uh, coached several years, coached Little League while I was there. And that was a lot of fun. I started coaching when David was... I wanted David to be able to play peewee baseball, and to get him to do it, I had to agree to coach. Well, I didn't know anything about coaching. I had played baseball in high school, but I started coaching, and it was a lot of fun. The uh, little black boys liked to be on my team. I don't know how it happened, but uh, it happened that way. Every year, I'd wind up with about half the team little black boys and half of them little white boys. And they just had a ball together. They, they didn't make any race distinction, of course, at that age. And I, oftentimes I would do pretty good at my baseball team with those little black boys playing. I remember one little black boy in particular, his name was Booty. <laughs> I don't remember what his last name was, but Booty was a tough little rascal. He was about nine or ten, and Booty was kind of the manager of the black boys on the team. And when Booty felt good and was playing good, I had a ball club. But when Booty was moody, and uh, he oftentimes was kind of moody, and when he was kind of messing around, why, that just seemed to permeate all the other kids. And my club wasn't so good when Booty was Moody. Had another little uh, black player I remember particularly. His name was Davel. And Davel was a uh, half-brother to Booty. And uh, he was a little, little skinny kid. His helmet come down clean over his ears, and he batted left-handed. And when uh, Booty could fly, he was a runner. And so I was always thrilled to see Booty get on base because I knew I could get that run in with uh, Booty on base. Uh, Amanda's asked me to tell some stories I remember about the children. Well, I'll start with the youngest, Mark. Uh, Mark was born in 1957, and he was uh, he was five years younger than David. Uh, we were almost 40 years old when Mark came, and uh, we. Uh, wondered how it would work out with the other four children and us at that age, but it worked out real good. We called Mark our little fall child, 
and uh, it was uh, we had had more time to spend with Mark the last one we had uh, a little more financial means we weren't as strapped for money always as when uh, we were with the other young older children and so uh, Mark was a Mark was an easy kid to raise. He was even tempered, and uh, he uh, was popular with other children. Made friends easily. Uh, he cared more about sports than he did about schoolwork. So had to stay on his back a little bit on schoolwork. But he he generally generally made it okay. Uh, I remember him developing a liking for sports early. We had this old house there on uh, 610 West Boulevard, and it was built in 1905, as I remember. So one time, Mabel and I decided we were going to repaper the thing. And it was a chore. We had to pick off four or five layers of paper to get down to the plaster, and then we had to replaster. But we got the job done, papered it, and we were so proud of the proud of it. Well, in the living room, on one wall, there was a hole about uh, four inches in diameter that uh, had been the flue where the old coal stove had set one time, and the flue pipe went up through that hole and out. And, of course, we'd papered that over. Well, Mark was sitting, he must have been about three or four, and he was sitting in the middle of the floor with a either a tennis ball or a baseball. And he drew back and threw that thing and threw it right through that flue hole and made a big old mess in our wallpaper. And uh, it tickled me because he was such a little guy and he could throw like that. Mabel wasn't as tickled as I was. Uh, I remember he got a little bigger, and every spring, why, he and I would get out and start playing catch. And one time, I was letting him bat, and I was throwing, throwing to him, and he hit one right straight back at me and hit my hand and knocked my little finger clean out of joint. That thing was just right angled. He just jumped up and down and went in the house yelling to his mama, 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 I broke Daddy's finger. I broke Daddy's finger. <laughs> I got to be about eight. He started playing peewee baseball and I was coaching. I uh, wanted to make a pitcher out of him and succeeded. He was a good little pitcher. And... Then when he got up about eight or nine, well, in springtime, he and I would get out and play catch, and he could throw pretty hard for a kid that age. And I remember my legs were just black and blue from my ankle to my knee where he had bounced one in on me, and I'd miss it. And I just kept, kept bruised legs the whole spring long. Um, I remember one team we had... Uh, had uh, about three good pitchers, Mark and a Pittner kid and a Dullworth kid, I remember, were my pitchers. And uh, I went to, went to district that year and didn't win it, but we played a good game. That was a whole lot of fun. Um, David, David was, uh, he was a, uh, High high energy kid, always always looking around. What can I get into? What can I do next? I remember one incident. One uh, one uh, July the fourth, I believe it was. He went out and was uh, popping firecrackers where he wasn't supposed to be, and a policeman collared him and brought him home with me, brought him home to me, and I remember the scared look on his face, and that policeman knocked on the door there, and David told. Uh, one time, he I didn't know this too much later, one time he told me he's out 
with one of his buddies shooting a 22 rifle, and he shot the uh, insulator out somewhere there and knocked all the lights out in the town. Of course, I didn't know about it at the time, but uh, that's, uh, that's what happened. David, too, loved sports. He loved baseball. He loved basketball. He, he was on my team. And uh, I remember one funny incident. We'd gone to district, and he was playing. He was about eight or nine playing second base. And uh, he, either, he either tripped or got knocked down, and here come a runner from first going to second. David laying on his back, reached up and tagged him out. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, I remember one incident, one of David's little buddies, his name was uh, <coughs> Wilkerson, I can't remember his first name. And they were about eight or nine, and uh, we were out uh, practicing one day, and I looked over and there was little Wilkerson taking, he was playing first base, taking a pee right on first base. And I went over and, what do you mean out here taking a pee? Well, he said, Mr. Mitchell, I was afraid if I left first base, you wouldn't let me play it again. A student, I never had to get on to him about his grades. He always, uh, always liked school. And uh, that was uh, one year when David was in the eighth grade, I remember. Mabel, by this time, she had went over to uh, OCW in Chickasha and had got her degree. And uh, she was teaching eighth grade science. And that was the year David was in the eighth grade. And uh, Mabel and I talked about it, how it would work out with uh, him being in her class. And if that would be a, a, a bother to her, but it didn't. He was he was just a model child that year in the eighth. He didn't give his mother a bit of trouble. Uh, Mabel taught uh, eighth grade science there for three or I don't know three or four years, and she really liked it. She uh, it was a kind of, to me, it was a little funny, her room. She was supposed to teach science, and she taught science, but she taught everything else. Uh, she taught home economics to the kids, because she was a home ec major as well as the elementary teacher. And I remember she taught fry bread, taught the Indians, learned how to make Indian fry bread, and taught fry bread to the kids. And she had all kinds of things in her room. Her room was a, was a marvel. Uh, snakes and frogs and everything else. And uh, one funny incident that happened. Uh, one time, one of the kids was uh, colored. It was colored water. They were uh, somehow or other had colored water in a beaker and they were heating the beaker and the blame forgot to turn the flame off and they're supposed to and the blame thing blew up and uh, scattered that colored water over several people and it looked like blood and, and other teachers come running in the room when they heard the noise and there was those kids and Mabel all covered with that colored water and they thought they'd all been killed. <laughs> but uh, she had a she had a real good time teaching eighth <coughs> grade there, and she was she was a good teacher. Uh, it was kind of a she uh, had to go to OCW. It seemed to me like at least a couple of years to finish up, and that was when uh, Mark was about uh, four or five when she did that. And uh, oftentimes she would take uh, Mark over to uh, Chickasha with her. And they had a place there where they, they 
took children and it, kind of a training experience for the girls that were going to school there. And they all wanted, they all wanted to pick Mark, Mabel said. They, he was a cute little old blonde-headed, curly-headed kid. And when the girls were picking out their children to work with, why well, Mark was one of the very favorites that they all wanted. But that was a real, uh, a real uh, joy when Mabel graduated. She graduated, as I remember, about the same year that Brooks did from OSU. And then we had a good friend, Jim Smalling, who was superintendent of schools there. And uh, uh, so Jim hired her as a teacher. It was kind of hard to get hired as a teacher there at Anadarko. There were more people wanting the job than there were jobs. Um, talked about Mark and David. Sarah was, uh, oh, I thought I called her my little hard luck kid. Seemed like anything bad happened to one of the kids. <coughs> it happened to Sarah uh, up in uh, South Dakota. A girl, they were playing, and the girl accidentally seemed to me like it was a baseball bat, hit her in the face with it. Then uh, she had real bad astigmatism, and uh, we didn't know it until she was about five, six years old. And we got her glasses while we were in Aberdeen, and uh, I remember Mabel asking the eye doctor, well, am I going to have trouble keeping glasses on her? And he said, Ms. Mitchell, this kid will enjoy these glasses so much and it will improve her sight so much that there will not be any difficulty there. And there wasn't. Sarah was so proud. She went out one night and said, Mama, Mama, I can see the stars. And uh, she had her, her distant vision was a, a marvel. We would drive to church down at Huron, which was 81 miles on Sunday morning. And there was a train ran between Huron and Aberdeen. And she said, Mama, see the choo-choo? And, uh, of course, none of us could see the train except Sarah. And she could really see it. She was, but up, up close, of course, her eyesight wasn't good at all. She couldn't see much glasses really did uh, improve. And then, uh, oh, she, uh, I remember broke her wrist one time when she was a teenage kid. And, uh, I think it seemed to me like she was about the only child that bro had a broken bone while they were growing up. And uh, that scared us because the doctor broke it at the point of growth, and the doctor told us that it might not go ahead and grow properly, but it did, and he did a good job of setting it. Uh, Sarah was a real good student at school. She uh, didn't have to get on to her about her homework. Uh, she uh, loved band. She played flute and piccolo in the band, and uh, she was the drum majorette, and uh, I think she was the band queen but uh, she, uh, she was a good student and she loved school. She graduated in uh, <coughs> Anadarko before we moved to uh, Albuquerque. Uh, when we moved to Albuquerque, I remember we bought a nice home, three bedroom, and we called one of the bedrooms Sarah's bedroom, but she never used it. She went to Oklahoma Christian after, right after graduation. Then her and Jim was married shortly after that. Um, Marty was uh, also a very good student, just always made top grades. She uh, was a pretty girl, very popular with the other kids. And she was nominated and most of the time won ever office that Anadarko High had. She was football queen and 
basketball queen, a band queen, and all the other type of queens you can talk about. Uh, sometimes it got a little uh, tense in the household. Marty would get a little bit tense and a little bit uptight and kind of permeated the rest of the household. Marty went through high school in uh, three years. She, uh, her junior year, she took some courses over at OCW in order to get enough credits to graduate. And uh, she was just turned 17 when she went to OC. Uh, Brooks was uh, kind of a happy-go-lucky kid. Uh, he, loved, he loved hunting and fishing and scouting and things like that better than he did uh, sports. Uh, he was kind of a disadvantage. He was in the seventh grade when we moved to Anadarko. And, uh, the coaches already had their boys picked out that they wanted for the teams and they devoted all their time to the guys they picked out. The other kids just got pushed to one side. So uh, Brooks really didn't play any uh, any sports at Anadarko. His main thing was scouting. He loved uh, scouting. He uh, made good friends in scouting. And some of the friends that he has today, even 40 35, 40 years later are friends that he made there in scouting. And, of course, I like that because most of the kids in scouting were, were good kids. They weren't, uh, they weren't the, uh, the uh, kids that got into trouble all the time, but they were good kids. Uh, Brooks didn't care his grades. Uh, he made average grades, and I remember telling him, uh, you're not an average kid, Brooks. You've got more than average, and you ought to do better. And he'd say, oh, Dad, you know, C's are okay. And uh, so he wouldn't, he wouldn't strive to excel. Of course, his later, his later life, he woke up, and he did much, much, much better in his uh, later schooling. Going back and uh, talking about Marty, I had told Amanda previously a story about Marty. One summer she went down to visit my mother in Arkansas, and uh, while she was there, she uh, met uh, met a boy. I don't know whether he was uh, his family was a friend of grandmother's or not sure how she met him, but anyhow, she was about 16. The boy asked her for a date to go to show one night, so Marty said yes. When he, uh, when he came to pick her up, uh, Grandma was all dressed up. She walked out to the car, and uh, Marty thought she was just walking out to tell her goodbye, but Grandma just proceeded to get right in the back seat of that car and go with him. She was going to be a chaperone, and that tickled Marty to death. Another story I remember about Marty, when she was about a sophomore or junior, she was running for a basketball queen. And the way they elected basketball queens, the players, uh, the players elected the girl that they wanted to be their queen. So it turned out that Marty and another girl were in a tie. And uh, they were uh, having another vote to see if they could break the tie and select which one was going to be queen. And Marty walked in school one day, and there was one of her friends. He was, uh, name was Donnie Kirkendall. Donnie was a, a black, uh, black boy that uh, went to church with us, and uh, really, he really did like Marty. And he had one of those white boys pinned up against the wall and holding his collar and saying, threatening him what he was going to do to him if he changed his vote. Now, you keep your vote with Marty Mitchell. And he was really, really threatening this guy what he was going to do if he changed his vote. Well, 
Marty got to be basketball queen 